Good morning. Uh, I take it that uh, everybody is uh, ready to start. It's uh, 10.01. I am uh, Philip Tissot. I am one of the co-PI for AI2ES and the interim director uh, for the Conrad Butcher Institute at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. And I'm going to let uh, the, my co-chair introduce himself as well. John? <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm John Williams. I'm Senior Scientist, Machine Learning, and Senior Manager, Forecasting Sciences at the Weather Company and IBM Business, and a Senior Leader in the NSF AI to ES Institute. And so this is day four of Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence for Environmental Science uh, Summer School. Um, thank you, NCAR, for organizing NSF, one of the funding agency. First, uh, a reminder uh, for, uh, whoops. Uh, for Slido, so uh, you have the QR code here. I'm going to leave it on for a little while, such that you can uh, uh, hop on Slido and be ready to submit great questions. Uh, the first three days have been fabulous. Just uh, keep at it. Um, the uh, rule, the code of conduct for our summer school. This has also worked really well during the first three days. So please keep at it, and um, we'll be uh, we're ready to start on uh, day four. So day four, we've got three blocks. So during the first three days, we, we talked about XAI, physics-based uh, ethics. And in day four, we're going to tackle uh, case studies. So for the first two hours, the first two blocks of one hour, we'll look at case studies in the coastal uh, ocean, uh, AI application for the coastal ocean. And then during the third hours, we're going to focus on how how does it how do we apply all this? So research to operation. And we have uh, three fabulous speakers: John Williams, Sue Ellen Hope, Jeff Stewart, who are going to tackle that from from different angles. And uh, then uh, we'll finish by a fireside chat, very much like we did yesterday in our ethics uh, uh, session. So I'll get started. We'll have uh, the first block. We'll have a uh, three talk: myself and uh, two PhD students. And uh, then Dr. Uh, Roy He will take over for the second uh, hour and get you a little further in the ocean. So I'm going to talk about early uh, early AI models, things we did in the, the 2000s. And the reason I'm talking to you about uh, those those methods, which which are a little outdated uh, te technical wise, is that we interacted a lot with stakeholders. So the trust part is going to to uh, to come into this. And uh, for, so why why AI in um, in the in the coast? Well, the coast is the intersection of land, ocean, atmosphere. There are a lot of nonlinear uh, processes that are worthy of being studied in a nonlinear manner. And uh, also predictions are quite important and impactful. So I'm gonna talk to you about early examples with inundation, uh, sea turtle conservation, and something we're developing now, coastal fog, where you'll see of how we're developing it to try to get to a trustworthy type of AI model. So, my first example is, is inundation. Uh, along the Texas coast, the tidal prediction, the tidal prediction here, this is a case uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years ago in, in 2019. And uh, the blue line here is the tidal prediction. The green lines are the measurement. And you can see there is a substantial discrepancy between the tidal prediction and the water levels. And that's the case for the whole Texas coast. And uh, tidal predictions do not meet federal standards in, in Texas. And the reason is, is strong winds. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. But basically, we can say the strong winds drive water levels uh, more uh, too much for the tidal predictions to, be, uh, to, to work. So in the early 2000s, we were looking for ways to um, to, to, uh, to incorporate the wind. At this time, numerical ocean predictions uh, were, were not uh, really there. Now, now that's, that's possible. And uh, so we fed, uh, we fed it, we use a shallow neural net. So you can see here, this is a very simple uh, shallow neural network. We feed in a recent observation up to six minutes. We, we had the high frequency measurements coming in to our uh, institute. We add numerical weather predictions for the next couple of days. We could have, but did not add numerical ocean predictions. We feed that into a neural net that we train to predict water levels. The result was excellent. It worked, uh, it worked very well for 24 and up to 36 to 48 hours during the location. Here, the blue is, is again the uh, tidal prediction. The black are the water level measurements, and the reds 
are the neural net predictions. So with neural net, including the wind forcing in real time, we could give uh, much better water level predictions. So that's kind of, uh, that worked well, that was nice. Uh, but the point I want to make, this is the slide I want to spend a little bit of time. So we, we, uh, we shared those predictions with our stakeholders uh, the, um, and different types of, of stakeholders. And that's going to be the point of, of, of this discussion, the National Weather Service. And National Weather Service type users are the one we talked about a lot during the first two days. But also for coastal beach managers, for folks dealing with turtle nesting and others. So we gave them the top graph on the left. Uh, the, little, uh, the little crosses, black crosses, are the measurements. And then the orange line is the neural net predictions. The green is a simple persistence model. The blue lines are, is the tidal prediction. Um, and a little anecdote, when, when we gave that, again, that I said, well, I'd love to put confidence interval. I'd love to give you more information about how well this uh, model works. And the response I got is, uh, well, Philippe, um, you know, give, give us that, we'll test it out. If it works, great. And uh, if it doesn't work, uh, then uh, we don't want to hear from you anymore. Well, not exactly like that. <laughs> uh, but the point is that the, the, the water levels or for the sea turtles, the, the other types of prediction, this is just one part of the decision making process. And they're not that interested in exactly how it works. So these type of stakeholders who, who use a lot of our data, uh, logistic data, um, supply chain data, uh, wants, they want the information in a relatively simple format, and they're not that interested into exactly how it works. In contrast to weather forecasters at the National Weather Service or the equivalent in other countries, where we really need, they really want to know how this works such that they, they know how, how to trust it. So this is my first message. And then the, the, the public at large is even, is even different. So this is my first message. We have very different audiences, and we have to calibrate trustworthy AI to the audience. Then what we did is that once you clicked on that top left panel, then you got to those six panels here. And those six panels on the right, the three panels here are the recent performance for 12 hour prediction, 24 hour prediction, 48 hour prediction. And again, a little cross out of measurements. The orange is the neural net. The green is a simple persistence model. The blue is the tide. And so they could see, okay, 12 hour predictions that work really well. 24 hours, not as well, 48 hours, that well. And of course, past, perform past recent performance is not exactly indicative of a future performance. But if you look at it quite a bit, then you, the user can get a sense of, of how it works. So it's trust, tr providing trust and a sense of how well it works by making it easy to see what the performance was. And this is also easier for this because there's only one variable that we're, that we're predicting. Um, in terms of research, we're continuing this type of research, but now we're trying to predict um, inundation, so including waves and run up, to, and that's part of AI2ES. My second example, and another uh, practical one, is with uh, cold stunning event and sea turtle. So you see here sea turtle. This is the Laguna Madre, a water body in South Texas, longest hypersaline uh, lagoon in, uh, in, in the US and the most in the world. And uh, the turtles love this water body, but in the winter time, when it gets cold, when it gets really cold, like this spring, we can have large cold stunning event where the sea turtles become lethargic. And if we don't rescue them, they die. And uh, the, all sea turtle species are endangered or threatened. So this is a, uh, we have to facilitate the, the saving of the, of the sea turtles. So the, the system works like this, a little more uh, illustration. The blue line are the water temperature in, the, in this water body. The red line is the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see the water temperatures drop a lot faster and a lot lower in this shallow water body, which explains why we have such large cold stunning event. We establish a, a threshold with my colleague, Dr. Shaver at the National Park Service. And uh, we, uh, we also have a coalition with folks such as uh, a barge association, uh, which members are ready to stop navigating. They're stop, ready to stop navigating during this time. We also have engineering company who are ready to stop uh, their operation, engineering, coastal engineering operations. But for that to be possible, we need to tell them uh, 36 hours in advance at least. So how to do that? That's where AI came in, in the late 2000s. And so we established a shallow neural net model, very much like the water levels. And instead of predicting water levels, we predict uh, water temperatures. So recent observation, numerical weather prediction, possibly not in this case, numerical ocean prediction, 
feed that into a shallow neural net and get our prediction. And this is an example in, uh, I think in 2010, uh, that shows that it worked pretty well. The, the first bar is when we asked for operations to stop. The second bar is when we said, all right, it's okay to resume. The red uh, bars there are the number of, of uh, cold stunned sea turtles rescued. It was well over in the, in the thousands, that event. Nothing like this spring, but a, a, pretty, a pretty large one, and it went. There was another event where we did not issue uh, a, um, uh, an advisory to stop operation, and there was not that many sea turtles, so it was probably a good compromise between the economic impact of asking people to stop and, uh, and, the, and the sea turtles. As far as sharing uh, performance, uh, as far as sharing trust, we did it through performance. So this is very similar to the water level where you have the measurements, you have the predictions, and a few days later, you can see how the model worked and it worked quite well in, the, in this case. So uh, trust and getting a sense of precision through uh, checking out easily the, the performance of the model. In this model also, this is work from Robin Ball in the late 2000s, we use random forest, which most of you uh, probably know well, and which Amanda discussed. And so with random forest, we were able to peer into the black box in this case. The different colors are the different types of predictors. Blue for past water temperature, green for the predicted air temperature, red for the past air temperature, and there's also a black dot for the water temperature in the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico. For a very short-term prediction, three-hour leads time, you can see that the recent uh, water temperature measurements dominate, which makes sense. The water temperature, good thermal inertia doesn't change that much. As you move to 12, 24, or 48 hour predictions, then you see that other variables take over. And for 48 prediction, it's the air temperature prediction that take over. Um, and interestingly, there's a four or five hour lag between the most important relative variable importance for a temperature and, uh, and the lead time. And so that was one way also to reassure ourselves and the users that the, the AI models made, made sense. Um, as in terms of research there, this, sp this uh, spring, we predicted the large uh, water, le water level, the large uh, cold stunning event. And we're now getting a mix of uh, national weather service prediction and also ensemble members from, uh, from IBM, IBM graph. So we have 100 ensemble air temperature predictions. And the research is figuring out how do we build better uh, AI, water temperature prediction model for AI, and also how to, ex how to express it. Because when you have that much information for our users, it's a challenge to, to distill it to something that is useful for them, and they don't want to spend a lot of time uh, studying it. So those are for two historical examples. And then I'm going to pass on to, uh, to uh, Evan and Hamid to talk about how we're developing a uh, deep learning model for coastal fog predictions. We're trying to mix in satellite imagery, sea surface temperature in this case, high frequency um, measurements and numerical weather predictions. And we want to do it in a way uh, similarly to the guidance we received in day one or two uh, with trustworthy AI and, and physics based AI. And um, I have a couple of minutes where I could take one, one or two questions before passing it on to, uh, to Amid. Um, any question, uh, Amy, or uh, um, do I do we pass it on to Hamid for? To there start? is one in there is one in the chat. Um, I don't know if Tasia wants to switch to the Slido. Uh, I can get to the chat. No, no, there's one in the Slido. I, if she can switch over. Okay. If not, I'll read it for you. It yeah, says. Please. <laughs> oh, there she goes. Okay. All right. What would an ideal neural net architecture, if one is interested in simulating uh, tidal trend or seasonal oscillations? So I think for seasonal oscillation, uh, at present, we just do short term. I think seasonal oscillations, it's too weather driven for, uh, for AI to, to predict and work on the seasonal oscillation. And uh, same thing for the long, longer long term trends. For the short term weather driven changes in water levels, and then uh, so far, a shallow neural net has worked well, but we're hoping that a deep learner that, uh, has, uh, that includes a broader range of, uh, of measurements uh, deeper into the Gulf of Mexico will work well. Hope that answers the questions and I'm gonna pass it on to Hamid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I'm trying to share my screen. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name Hi. is Hammond. Yes. Sorry, you're still in. Uh, we can still see presenter mode. So. How about now? It's better. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hamid Kamangir, and uh, right now I'm working as a researcher uh, with CBI. As Dr. Tissot said, uh, we're developing uh, a model specifically for fog prediction. And right now, actually, we're working on kind of like analysis this architecture and make it more efficient, more consistent with the explainable AI and having some analysis on top of that architecture. So uh, first thing I'm going to talk about the Fognet, which is a paper that we published it, which is a 3D based CNN model specifically for fog. Uh, and on top of that, I'm going to kind of like having some sense of this architecture that how much we need to stay with the 3D based model because 3D CNN based model uh, time, uh, uh, computationally is more expensive compared to the 2D. We, have, we need to have some reason actually to stay with 3D based model, and we will see some results based on the variable order in, in, in this 3D cube for the 3D based model, which how much is important. And I will show you the results and the reason behind it, this experiment. And we will see some, some analysis on the different component of the Fognet because we want to make it more simple and more uh, robust architecture for future works. So we wanted to have some sense of, sense of these different components of the architecture and uh, and make it more, more better and better for future. And also we will see some results of the physical variable feature importance based on the permutation feature importance when we pulled out and shop. And on top of that, uh, Evan will more explain about the shop and different type of the uh, analysis on uh, explainable AI. So for the fog net, actually as a case study, we, we use the, the, this architecture on Port of Corpus Casey, which is, which is one of the most important ports in the United States in terms of the tonnage is the fifth large port, in fact. And uh, as a visibility or target or label, we use the visibility at most time be sure port uh, on this area. As a main goal, we try to predict the fog for three different categories, less than 600 meters, 32, and 6,400 meters for 6, 12, and 24 hours lead time prediction. And depending on the different type of the lead time prediction, we had between 288 to 384 different 2D maps of the numerical weather prediction output. And also, we have the SSD high resolution SSD uh, data set from the MORE data set for NASA. As I said, we have a large amount of the variables for, for this architecture, which including the different type of the variables, NAM, which is the initialization and predictor variables, such as the dew point temperature at two meters, visibility, vertical velocity in different level, wind, for example, specific humidity, and et cetera. And also we have the, the MORE, which is the sea surface temperature with high resolution, and a combination of these two type of the uh, uh, variables, including the, the um, temperature two meters minus SSD, dew point minus SSD, and temperature two meters minus uh, dew point, which all of those three different uh, variables that we generated are uh, very important for advection fog, in fact. But let's talk about the architecture. Architecture, as I said, is a 3D based architecture that we designed it for fog, uh, as you can see in this figure, seems kind of like complicated, but worked very well, actually. And the reason that we decided to have a 3D versus the 2D or 1D is that so uh, as much the, 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 the spatial correlation between the pixels is important, we saw that probably the correlation between the input variables are important too. And 3D convolution will help to learn those uh, uh, correlation also compare, uh, ver, uh, along with the spatial correlation. Uh, part of the architecture, which is important, we, we uh, have a double branch feature learning. We separate the spatial correlation between the pixels and also the variable wise correlation in two different branch with two different uh, uh, architecture. In fact, or kind of like the bunch of the uh, convolution that we use specifically for those two branches. And also we have a multi-scale feature extraction, which we're thinking is important for, for meteorological application. 
and uh, we categorize the input data set between different groups based on their similarity. And in this case, we use the physical similarity and we put them in the different five different groups. As a data set, we have a data set between 2009 to 2020. Between 2009 to, uh, to 2017, we use it for training and validation and the rest for the testing. So that was kind of like the uh, short explanation of the architecture, but I will discuss it more in next slide. So from here, we saw that, so, okay, we have Fognet. Fognet worked uh, very well for a specific clock prediction. We got a very good result. We published a paper, et cetera, but we want to have more explain, uh, kind of scalable for, uh, architecture for future works, more efficient for explainable AI, more explainable architecture intrinsically by itself, uh, to be able to, to have some explainable inside and also on top of the architecture. And also we want to have some sense of the physical base design of the architecture, how much is important. We will see some results and we'll discuss them. So simply saying, you know, about the, 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 the 2D uh, convolution, how they work versus the 3D. So 2D just learning the, the spatial correlation between the pixels and 3D trying to learn uh, uh, in depth too, kind of like correlation between the variables. But in these terms, actually, when we want to use a 3D convolution, we know uh, the order should be important. If not, actually, there is no reason to use a 3D convolution. And, and, and there is a high correlation between the uh, uh, variables. So we try to kind of like um, having some comparison between this architecture that we have, which is a 3D based architecture versus different 2D architecture. So we first try to compare the Fognet 2D with, with uh, Fognet 2D, which is uh, the, the convolution is different. I mean, the all, everything is the same, architecture is the same. We just convert the 3D convolution versus to 2D convolution. And also we had almost 10 different benchmarks such as DenseNet, TransNet, AlexNet, BGG, and et cetera. And we got all those three uh, uh, different models gave us a good result. So we put only these three different uh, uh, architecture results here. So you can see uh, the result for the Fognet 3D is much more better than all those 2D base architecture, as you can see here. For example, and more specifically Fognet 2D, which is Everything is set the same, only the convolution or kernel is different, uh, 3D versus 2D. And we can see how much the Fognet 3D is better than even Fognet 2D. And that's only because of the kernel, in fact. Uh, one of the things that was kind of like important to have a, a, a reason to use the 3D convolution is uh, the order of the variables. So based on that, we shuffled the, 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 the order of the variables in different groups within the group, in fact. And you can see, and kind of like we disconnect all those correlation between the variables versus to, to the fog, in fact. And we, we can see the result here, how much we got a better result when we have a specific order and you need an expertise person to, to define those orders actually. But here you can see how much the order for the, the, the input variable for 3D based uh, CNN is important. Um, so, I use several actually modules in this architecture, such as dense net, such as uh, uh, attention mechanism, such as a multi scale feature extraction using the dilated convolution. And we wanted to know how much they're important for us. And we will see the result, but also uh, kind of like I put, so uh, I separate the spatial and spectral or variable wise feature learning to parallel branch. We will see those two uh, uh, experiment and also the, the importance of the grouping. So for the grouping, we kind of like tying those, those features or parameters learned by each groups, which is more autocorrelated features, and then combine them somewhere before the classifier or regression or a kind of like decision maker at the end of the architecture. So we'll see how much the grouping which will be important kind of to, to have a more generalized uh, architecture to control the overfitting problems. So first experiment was the grouping. Uh, as I said, we have, or we split the data set between five different groups, group one, one to five, based on their physical similarity. For example, the group one, all are related to the wind. Group two, turbulence, kinetic energy, and humidity. Group three, lower atmosphere, term thermodynamic and profile, et cetera. So uh, we, we can see the result here based on the Fognet versus the Fognet video grouping. I just put all those variables in the one cube and and fit it on the architecture. 
And you can see, for example, here in, in this experiment for 10 different iteration, we got a totally better result for the fog net when we separate them in the different groups and then learn a kind of like more distinguishable and autocorrelated features from the beginning and then put them somewhere before the, uh, the classifier and combine them. So that was the first experiment. And we see that how much the physically grouping meteorological inform, uh, input variable are important. Here, uh, kind of like relative and it depend on the architecture. Actually, it's so hard to, to explain it more general here because it depend on the person and how do you want to, for example, design your architecture. But I use this modules attention, multi-scale or spatial, spectral and sequentially learning, uh, which is the puddle actually, and I compared the result with the sequential. But generally here, based on the experiment, I got the, this message that spatial wise, and a spatial correlation between the pixel is the most important module that I use in my architecture specifically for myself. The rest are important. They gave me a good kind of like uh, improvement on the architecture, but uh, you know, it depends, depend on the task and depend on the architecture. It's hard to, to discuss it more general here. At the end, we try to have some, some explainable AR and getting some feature importance here based on the different groups, not exactly uh, for each of the variables. For the next presentation, you will see presentation by Evan, uh, which will more discuss on the, the variable-wise um, explainable AI. But I use the permutation feature importance, one group holdout, and shap inspired permutation, which I kind of like modified the shap shapely additive uh, uh, explanation techniques. Uh, I got this result, gave me some message that group four and group one, because after having the visibility and humidity, they're so important. Group five, which is the SSC, also is important, and group two, which is more related to the kinetic is kind of like less important compared to other uh, uh, groups. But we will we will see some more more explainable um, result for the next presentation by Evan here. So yeah, that was kind of like uh, the presentation that I have here. We're working on this this architecture, make it more more efficient, and uh, probably we're going to to uh, uh, try it for the bigger scale for the Gulf of Mexico and. Um, where we're going to add some some modules on architecture to make it more explainable compared to the simple uh, fragment that currently that we have. Uh, thank you so much. I'm ready for a uh, question here. Trying to go back to the... So how many number output you set in your model? So. Uh, we have a binary classification here, fog and not fog, or, you know, like two type of the, the uh, fog that we have, like a binary classification, fog or not fog, in fact, uh, as I uh, kind of like, I'm not sure that I get your question correctly or not, but how many number output you set in your model? So if you are talking about the target, we have a two uh, binary fog and non-fog um, output for our model. LSTM, of course, is a very good option, um, no doubt, because uh, LSTM trying to learn the time series or kind of like the time, time depend, time correlation or temporal correlation between the variables. But in this case, actually, our structure of the data set that we have is more for the classification, not for prediction. In fact, we have a binary classification. We can definitely uh, redefine the uh, uh, data set and kind of like define it the, in the way that we have it in the terms of the temporal definition of the data set and using the LSTM. And even, even for example, a combination of the 3D convolution and LSTM, like a convo LSTM would, uh, would be a good option for future works, of course. Yes. That last question was from Philippe, so. Yeah, and, uh, 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 yeah, Raghavendra, if, if you want to email me also, I'd be delighted to talk some more about tidal predictions and water level prediction. I hope I answered your question previously. There's one that just came in for Hamid. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, of course, but as you, as you can, first of all, those, those different uh, uh, permutation or feature importance uh, methods that we use are different. They're learning in the different way. So, it's hard to be the same for sure, but they kind of like gave us the same message, which the group one and group three 
group, group one and group four are the most important groups and group two are the less important groups compared to the other groups. But all of them has some importance. We, we didn't see like a groups without any importance, for example. We saw that all of them are important, but with different uh, level, but they're, they're kind of like saying the same uh, message. When you group by your data from your data set, would you expect a better outcome uh, in relation to your correlation? Your, when you're grouped by your data from your data set. So I did the same, but I did the, the grouping based on their physical similarity. It can be different. It can be based on the correlation as you mentioned it here. Um, but of course, because uh, a valent from the new national weather service gave out this message that probably based on the physical similarity physical similarity would be more important for this case and we categorize them based on the physical similarity actually um one more question yeah do you find extremes show off your ai or did you find it handle extreme high temperature variation cases well um not sure actually i get your question did you find extremes throw off your ai or did you find it handled so if you have a really a big ex extreme variation coming in in your data is it going to make your model be robust is it gonna is it gonna still oh. predict something uh, yeah, of course so it, actually that's that's a new kind of like that that was the reason that i'm lo looking for new data set i want to check the robustness of the architecture currently the architecture for this kind of data set that we have is very robust as you can see all those because those the box box plotted that I showed you is for 10 different situations, right? And it's more robust in compared to the other different techniques that we have. But I want to try it with different data set. At that case, I can say more confident that this architecture is more robust or how much is robust or uh, is robust to the extreme so far or not. And we're, we're going to uh, switch to, to Evan, who's a PhD student as part of AI to AES. And there was a sharp question in, uh, in, the, in the talk. And I think you'll be pleased to hear uh, something about SHAP. We're going to switch to his presentation. And uh... OK. All right, hello everyone. I'm Evan Grell, and this is building off of what we just saw from Hamid. This is Fognet, but where Fognet was doing XAI based on the groups, we're trying to dig a little bit deeper and do some XAI on the specific uh, channels or the different features of Fognet. Evan, are we supposed to be seeing your slides? Yes, we should be. <laughs> yes. We don't, we don't see them yet. Thank you for... Can we see them now? Yes, thanks. OK, Great, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> OK, so quick outline. Um, there's some background, which we'll, we'll look at briefly. Some of this is really just for if you're looking at later to learn more about the methods, because we want to get into the new stuff we're doing, um, modifications to a technique called partition shaft that we're calling channel-wise partition shaft, how we visualize it in 3D, and the results of this, some initial results on Fognet. Um, so since you just saw Fognet, won't belabor it here, main thing is want to point out the shape of the input data, right? So you can see there's, depending on the lead time, 288 to 384 channels. So it's much more information across the depth than the spatial height and width. And we have these five channel or physics-based channel groups with, uh, that, that have groups like wind, turbulent kinetic energy, etc. So these similar features are adjacent in the channels. Um, and you know we, we've seen some of this in the first, especially in the first two days, right? You've seen images like this where there's you're explaining the output of a classification model. So you get this heat map. Um, you it's typically two-dimensional, right? So either looking at the pixels or super pixels in the images and how much those contributed towards the specific prediction. Um, but even with an RGB image, you might ask the question like, well, was a specific color more important than the other? And that's not captured here. Um, if we look at this picture, so this is like a little fake, a fake example. If we did this on Fognet and we're saying, okay, spatially, this is the important pixels or super pixel regions, but 
as far as an explanation goes, it's somewhat unsatisfying because this is just telling you where, but actually we're interested, right? And like, what well, was it the wind? Was it like higher than average kinetic energy? Like, like what exactly of the many physical variables related to the prediction of fog rather than just in space? So what we want to see is something like these heat maps, but that goes across the channels as well. Um, and you know, beyond just fog net, this could be of interest if you're working with, for example, hyperspectral imagery, right? Like what was the um, impact of the near, near infrared band, right? Or spatiotemporal, you know, some, some um, what time section in your, in your raster was relevant. Um, but, the, you know, you can also have these rasters where the bands don't have anything to do with each other. It's just a convenient way to group data to put into your models. And the kind of data you have affects the XAI questions you want to ask and how you set up your XAI technique. So we've been exploring a lot the permutation based methods, right, which you saw some from Hamid's where he's doing it in groups, right, like permutation feature importance, or another one is Lime, which takes the input data, perturbs it a bit and says, okay, you've got this really complex model, it's hard to explain, but just for this local instance, let's perturb the inputs, see how that affects the output, and then actually fit a simple linear regression that we can explain. The problem is that linear regression isn't guaranteed to actually be good, right? And just um, like if you check the, the Christoph Molnar book that's been mentioned in, I think, day two, uh, he has some discussion about how experience with running Lyme twice on the exact same thing and getting totally opposite explanations. So SHAP is like Lyme and it can produce you know, these type of explanation plots, but based on game theory, where you have a single optimal solution, where you're saying for each of your feature, which you know in this case could be pixels or super pixels, how much did that contribute to the final prediction, though it does struggle a bit with correlated features as we will see. Um, so we wanted to build on the SHAP methodology here. So some challenges for rasters is like, you know, how do you explain the correlated features when we know, you know, we know SHAP and a lot of these methods actually have issues with correlation. Um, and we have both spatial autocorrelation, but we also have autocorrelation in the channels because each of these groups is, you know, adjacently meaningful, like the wind or, at you know one at like two meters and then ten meters etc right so there's correlation lots lots of autocorrelation um, don't want to spend too long here but just the idea with partition shap is that well if you group the features you know, it might help because if you're just taking like this bird and you say okay what happens if we take out one tiny pixel on the beak you know you really expect your model to be robust and not not well affected by that. But if you take out like the entire eye or a big chunk of the beak, you can start to ask, well, what do these various bird parts imply or, or how do they affect the prediction of bird, right? So our idea was to take this partition shaft and just expand it to the depth as well, the, ex the channels, not just in space. Um, so the partition shaft algorithm uh, gives you a local explanation, right? So you get these SHAP values that are calculated for a single instance. Um, and what it tells you, like this is just a simple tabular example to, to make it clear. Um, each For each feature, you have how much that feature either took you away from or further towards the, like some baseline prediction, which could be um, like the average model output, or it could be the, you know, the, just the prediction of the model without doing any of the like permutations, right? And the way this is done for partition shaft is you generate a partition tree, which is you start with your, like here we see like a three by three by two simple little raster, and then you split it along the rows and columns. And then finally, when you're at a single, like one row, one column pixel, then you start chopping it along the channels the problem there is that you typically don't even get to that because you control how deep you go with the maximum evaluations. And when you're that zoomed in, you're not really taking advantage of the idea of 
looking at groups of data. Um, and just to give a little more insight here how this works, right? So you take your, um, you know, your, your input data and partition shaft generates this tree of masks where, where here like the black means you're going to permute that and the white you're going to keep that free. And then you combine these masks in various ways to, you know, test out like what happens with, you know, for example, again, the bird's eye, like with and without that eye in the image. Um, however, you know, you have to replace, you, you can't really just say, here's an image, but part of it's gone. You have to put something there. And with partition chap, the question is, what method do you use? There's no real, like, theoretical guidance on how to do this. So they just provide lots of methods, like taking the surrounding pixels to paint across that region or blurring it or replacing with a constant value. Uh, curiously, there's no option for random values, but we have our, like our own version of partition chap where we put that in. Um, and what you choose can just very quickly, you can see it, it does affect um, the explanation. Um, so, but we're going to spend more time looking at this actually on FogNet. So just this just for, for let your reference. So what we've done is modified it slightly to make channel wise partition shaft. So the top there you see that's the default, right, which we've already looked at. And the important thing is those maskers you can see are uniform across the red, blue, green channels, right? However, with ours, before we ever break spatially, we split across all the channels and then we break that into super pixels. So you can see now that when we're creating our maskers, it's non-uniform so that we can test the importance of a specific super pixel in a channel. Um, and there's lots of options of ways you could do this. So I'm just going to bring your attention to a few. So number two, this is like your typical XAI output, right? Heat map across the pixels. Partition shaft is the, the default partition shaft is number five, where you've now you're looking at super pixels instead of specific pixels. And the, what, what our channel wise partition chap is number seven, where first you break along all the column, I mean, all the channels, and then you break it into super pixels. And you can see there's, there's a variety of things you could do depending on what you're trying to study. So how this was implemented was, you know, we have our own uh, fork of the shaft library where we've just added some options. You can see, you can set a partition scheme and you can also set how, which channels you actually want to output in your plots. So it's, it's quite easy to use. Um, and if you go to these, this GitHub repo, you can see we have some simple demos on like an RGB data set and some satellite imagery, just little simple notebooks that you can access and, and learn how, how we applied this technique. Um, the problem is, you know, once you have 384 bands, you don't really want to look at 384 plots, especially if some of these bands are related to each other and you're interested in the across, like patterns that may be across channels. Like, was just one wind channel have this little important super pixel or, or is this across several, right? So we developed a, a simple 3D tool to look at this a little better. Um, and that's have a little video here. So I'm skipping straight to the, the 13 band multispectral example. Um, and we use, you know, these sliders to set, you know, the magnitude of the shat values, both in the positive and negative direction that we want to look at so that we can kind of dig a little deeper and see these sort of across channel patterns. And then you can see on the right, that's just the whole 13 channels plotted individually. And that's on YouTube to, so you can look at that more if you like. So now we're running it on FogNet. You can see, you know, you pull out this big 3D uh, visualization, this model. 
um, still a bit tricky to, to analyze. So what we did here is we ran the channel-wise partition chap on the 2019 test instances. So all 131 of the FOG predictions and then a match randomly picked 131 of the non-FOGs. Um, we evaluated this enough times with partition chap so that it would be divided into quadrants. And each one of these takes about 10 minutes to run. But you know that we had to make a choice here, which is the best masking, which is the appropriate masking method to use. And we determined this through some, some experiments that we'll see on the next slide. Um, so, you know, looking at this, it's a little bit, it's still a little bit complex. So we decided, you know, before tackling the harder problem of channel wise and spatial super pixels, let's first think about what are the top bands? Because that's something that's a little bit simpler to, to analyze based on these results. But first, how do we pick the masker? So we tried three blurring kernels and three constant value replacements. And we found that the blurring results were tended to be inconsistent, right, compared to the um, value replacement where you get basically the same output, um, slightly different, no matter what you pick. Actually, we, we chose a lot more than just these three, but we're sharing these three. So we, we chose 0 0.5. And the hypothesis here is that, you know, with images, blurring makes a lot of sense because, you know, you have all these, you know, CNNs are doing a lot of image um, edge detection, right? Like looking at, you know, here's the edges that define noses and bird beaks and all these things. Um, but if you blur, right, like sea surface temperature, then you're really just averaging it out and you're possibly not really getting rid of the feature. Like a lot of the original information we think is still in there, whereas you completely get rid of it with the value replacement. Uh, so then we plotted out the top channels. Uh, so what's going on in this plot is, so this, this green piece up here, this is the number of times that a band of occurs in the top 25 important bands based on the absolute shaft value. For the, the top part is all for fog cases. And the bottom here with the purple, these are the non-fog cases, just to see if there's any difference there. And then we have, we repeat this graphic, but then below it mirrored, we're showing the bottom 25 bands. So, you know, just the quick takeaway here, and we've got these purple lines separating groups. So this right here is group three, and the quick takeaway is like group three seems to be just completely unimportant, which if you remember from Hamid's results, that, that wasn't really the case, but we're going to look into, we believe we have an explanation of why. And then over here, this is just the top 25 again, but positive SHAP values and negative SHAP values. Um, but choosing top 25 channels was, you know, completely arbitrary. So to make sure that's consistent, we have this, <clears throat> we did it for, for all of them, you know, 0 to 384. And it's very consistent that um, it takes a long time for the group three channels to be important according to this method. And you know, not, not to read this here, but just to show, we also produced you know, a, a CSV, a table of the bands sorted so that you can look at what the top bands actually were. And this is what we give to Waylon Collins from the National Weather Service and ask him like, okay, does this make sense? Um, but we still need to go a little bit deeper because like, it's good to know what channels Fognet's using, right? But the problem here is that we can look at these and say, oh yeah, that, that band makes sense. It's great for predicting fog. So we, we feel like we trust it. But at the same time, like we put all these bands in here because we thought they'd help us predict fog. So the, we want to use the spatio and channel wise values to start looking at, okay, but what are these a little bit deeper? So the next is to say like, okay, well, if the you know, wind velocity is in this range and another variable is in this other range repeatedly, and this seems to be an important pattern, that we can then say, well, do those values make sense? Those more specific, like actual value ranges make sense for fog prediction. Um, but let's compare real quick to what Hamid had with his group-based XAI. 
So just a reminder, he, he, he applied permutation, um, group-based SHAP, and group holdout where he's actually retraining the whole model. And um, group three has some importance. So, you know, what I myself don't have the domain knowledge, so I just thought, oh, okay, well, who's right, who's wrong? But we sent this in from this, basically these, and all this information to Wayland Collins, and his interpretation is that this is totally expected based on um, why these bands were chosen. So this is telling us these are individually, specifically bands that are useful for fog prediction. Whereas the stuff in group three, individual channels are not actually expected to be, we don't look at the individual channels in group three to determine or to try to predict fog. Instead, group three, there's patterns. It's, it has vertical structure, right? So there's actually the patterns that we use to predict fog. So there's no way that looking with the channel-wise partition shaft, where the first thing we do is go straight to, we're looking at a single channel, it can't give you that information. Um, so it won't be important. It shouldn't be important with that technique. Whereas Hamid, who's taking the entirety of group three and taking it out, can find that. So ultimately, we feel like these are two kind of complementary methods. One tells you specifically distinct bands that are important. And then Hamid can tell you these groups of bands together are important, like the, the structures. Um, there's some bonus slides for people to check out on their own, like a little, uh, the, the whole partition chap algorithm I've tried to summarize for you because this isn't actually available anywhere online. This is from reading the code. So that's just something you can check out on your own. Um, and that's it, questions. Maybe start the video. All right, so we've got questions on Slido's. So it was pointed out that the blurring kernels will drastically affect the resulting explanation. Have you considered a consensus technique to find an average kernel explanation for you, Evan? We did talk about that actually. Like, you know, if you, all of these say a little bit, but if you run them all, um, yeah, you could find a consensus. I mean, the only problem here is it takes about 10 minutes just to run like one instance with one kernel. And that's actually only breaking it into spatial quadrants. And we do want to go deeper. So it's going to get actually a lot as kind of an exponential, right? Increase in the time it takes as we go deeper. So we should probably do it maybe on a few instances and see if it's useful. And then if it is, we just have to go ahead and take the computational time and do that. Um, to clarify, does partition chap auto select feature groups or are these users specified if auto selected? Um, so it's actually, there's kind of two answers. If you're doing tabular data, it first clusters the features. But if you're sending in raster data like here, it just says, okay, here's your channels. We're gonna break it into every channel. And then in those channels, it does the spatial super pixels, right? So it's not really looking at groups of channels, though that's something I, we have a little bit of early code that does it. And um, we, we don't have results yet, but we're trying that. Basically we want to do similar to Hamid's with the groups, right? Take the physical groups that we get from Waylon Collins, but then also do clustering, right? And more data driven and see if we can set this. But for now, it's really not clustering the groups. Hamid has the groups from Waylon Collins, but then for this technique, we're just looking at a channel and then keep splitting that channel quads and then quads of the quads, et cetera, if that makes sense. How much do the models take? So if we're talking about the model, um, that might be for Hamid rather than about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I have response to that. I have response to that. I replied to him. You, sure. you did, but I thought it was worth actually saying out loud. So that's why I highlighted it. Okay, so, yeah, so for, for the fog that you actually 
we use a four GPUs. You know, that's that's a very important point here. We use the four GPUs at the same time, parallel processing, something like that. So for that one, for chaining, it took two hours for chaining. But for the test, that was a couple of minutes. But uh, I got the another question that CPU is worse to have it or not, but actually CPU is gonna be very hard for having like a, a, a tensor base processing that's that's gonna be make it very complicated, time consuming for sure. But GPU is required, but it depends how much and how many GPU that you have. But based on the four GPU, we, we got this amount of the time, two hours for training and a couple of minutes for test. Uh, you know, like for the real time, it's it's hard to discuss it actually. Depend what's that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for for operationalization, we we're not planning to make Fognet operational for 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 a while. The, our operational model are are simple, uh, a simple shallow neural net uh, model at at present. Uh, and I'll make a comment also for for everybody. Uh, complex models are great. They're, they're really important to push the envelope and, and study, but you should always compare with a very simple model that may not give you the full uh, performance, but is uh, it's just simpler to implement, to run. Then uh, let's see for who that question is. Can you explain how you decide the distribution of training data? Should you put in 50, not fog, 50 fog, or should we put data according to the distribution in the real world data? Hamid, do you want to answer? Uh, for the distribution of the data set, you mean for the uh, for, for the training, like for the using the GPU or splitting the data between right, the training? training. And set? That's uh, it's not clear for me the question. So we we typically reinforce small small cases. We use SMOT. I don't think we did that for the Fognet 3D. Uh, but we uh, we often try to emphasize the the small the small categories. If if it's like some things for having training in in the way uh, to to pick up or sampling during the training, pick up fifty cases of the fog or fifty cases not fog to kind of maybe maybe not it's not that your question to to control the the over. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, imbalance situation, but no, we, we didn't do that actually. We didn't take a sampling in, during the training, no. All right, I, I think that's gonna conclude the, the, our first uh, block. Um, another another take-home advice also is uh, use several XAI. That was also part of uh, uh, one and two. For Fognet, uh, both Hamid and and, uh, and Evan got different results depending on the XAI methods they use, and that was really interesting to discuss the results with our atmospheric science uh, specialist in the in the team. And uh, I'd recommend multiple uh, methods. And uh, Amy, I think that's uh, we're gonna take uh, now a five minute breaks. Um, now we the can go ahead for ten the minutes. The schedule break. says ten, and so that's what my question to you was because we've been doing five. Um, Roy, do you want do you want fifty five or fifty minutes? <laughs> yeah, I think we can start at uh, 10, 10 minutes past hour, twelve ten. Okay. All right. Okay. Last day, we're gonna give you a slightly longer break, and we're, so we're looking <laughs> forward to see you back at eleven ten. And uh, Roy is gonna take us in the in the second uh, block. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome back for the second hour of today's sessions. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Roy He is the Goodnight Innovation Distinguished Professor in the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences at North Carolina State University and Director of the Ocean Observing and Modeling Group. He's also a co-PI for the NSF AI2ES Institute. Thank you and welcome, Roy. Great, well, thanks so much, Yang, and hello, everyone. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, could you put this in the presentation mode? Okay, great, thank you. Yes, so as John mentioned, my name is Roy He. I am an oceanographer and a professor at NC State University. For the next 40 to 45 minutes, uh, also, so my PhD student, Laura McGee, and I will give a presentation on AI research in coastal and larger scale oceanography. Next slide, please. Okay, so both Laura and I are members of Ocean Observing and Modeling Group at NC State. So our group uh, conduct research on remote sensing, marine environmental modeling, data analysis, data simulation. We study ocean circulations, biogeochemical interactions, and, and also as part of this AI2ES uh, Institute, we'll be working to incorporating AI and machine learning into ocean remote sensings and also, also ocean prediction. Next slide, please. So uh, for today's presentation, Laura and I will be doing an alternating tech team presentation. So AI and machine learning in oceanography uh, as we know, it's a very active research area. So we will start by reviewing several new uh, AI and machine learning studies on oceanography topics, ranging from currents, wave, hurricanes, the carbon flux, hypoxia, and reef currents. We will then discuss two of our own research, uh, one on the mesoscale ocean eddies and the other on the cloud-free satellite data reconstruction. Next slide, please. So okay. I will then uh, turn over to Laura for her to talk about the, the surface currents. Well, thank you so much, Roy. Uh, and I'm really glad to be here today. So I'm gonna get us started off um, with the discussion of surface currents. So there's a number of reasons why we want to understand and predict surface currents. Um, they transfer uh, physical variables like heat and salinity across the ocean. They also are very important for transporting things like nutrients uh, for the larvae of creatures. Uh, so they're very important biologically as well. They significantly influence food webs and marine organisms. On top of that, they're important for commercial activities, shipping, things like environmental recovery after oil spills and emergency preparedness. So we really want to know what the ocean currents are doing. So the paper that we're going to highlight here is by Sinha and Abernathy in 2021. Uh, and this paper is focusing on uh, inferring global surface currents from sea surface height. Now, the authors note that surface currents are often inferred from variables that are observable, like sea surface height and wind stress, uh, often done by applying these diagnostic balance relations, which give us a pretty good approximation of the dynamics of currents that are slow and large. However, uh, we're getting some new satellites launched, um, like one that will hopefully be launching in about a year and a half. that are going to capture more of this small scale variability um, and that's, you know, we always like to have more, um, more resolution. So we'll have this higher spatial resolution, um, but still a low temporal sampling. And that means that when we apply these new observations to these uh, diagnostic balance relations, they might not represent the surface currents very well. So the author said, hey, let's train a neural network to infer surface currents from these satellite observations. So they are taking as input sea surface temperature, sea surface height, and wind stress. And they are training a number of different neural networks to predict surface currents. Uh, so they did a simple linear regression model. Uh, they did a neural network, just a feed forward neural network. And then they did a couple of neural ne networks where they added convolutional filters. They did uh, convolutional filters in space and then one that had convolutional filters in space and time. And so they trained all of those to see which ones would produce the best surface current output. Uh, now they go into a pretty in-depth analysis of which model is best. Um, so I'm just going to show results from their best neural network. 
So here in the top figure, you're looking at the model predicted root mean square errors uh, for a number of different models. The furthest left is just their simple physical model. Um, and then the one beside that is the linear regression. From there, the next two are the neural network trained on the local uh, region and then on a global region. And the image on the furthest right is the Rosby number, which is um, here a, an idea, uh, just to show you exactly how nonlinear this system is. Um, so they note that uh, the linear regression is not performing very well. It has really high root mean squared error, but the neural network for both the local and the global training is doing quite well. Uh, it has lower root mean squared error than the physical model. So they note that the neural network is able to represent these zonal and meridional velocities in a really complex environment such as the Gulf Stream, and it's comparable to our physical models, and it's able to show this really high scale variability, which means that when we have um, this really fine resolution data, that this is a viable method for determining surface currents. And with that, I'll pass it back to Roy. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Laura. So the next topic is on the wave energy. So um, this is an important um, effort because there's lots of uh, uh, research and, and uh, industry, both in, on the industry side and also on academic side, looking to renewable energy. And uh, when we talk about wave energy, on the global wide, we're talking about uh, potentially 300, um, more than 300 gigawatts uh, energy that can be extracted from the wave. So this is much higher energy density than the solar energy and also uh, more than the wind energy. So there's a huge potential here in terms of uh, getting uh, the energy from the ocean wave. But wave is also very um, dynamic. So it has um, uh, different variabilities over the monthly seasonal annual and decadal time scales. So the effort here is try to have a, uh, accurate predictions about the, the wave height and, and also wave energy period. Uh, both are, are very important for mechanical structures and economic viabilities. And they also need to have a, a good models which can show consistent and also predictable uh, generations of the power. So this paper, next slide please. Uh, published by uh, Bento et al. also in this year, looking to using uh, machine learning and AI technologies to, uh, to best predict the wave height, wave period, and wave energy. So they're pretty smart by, by using the so-called circling approach. So in this case, uh, they are looking into seven different um, machine learning AI architectures and also seven different uh, input variables. So together, they're looking to a 17 dimensional space. And, and they are doing a search in the circling approach. So this way, they are trying to minimize the arbitrariness. Um, but, but, but rather than, you know, decide by human, they, they, they are having this um, 17 dimension search and to do the calculation iteratively and, and then find the best uh, solutions best combinations of um, architectures and, and, uh, and also input variable. So they are using this a deep newer network and DNA of forecasting uh, modeling approach. And uh, go to next slide, slides, please, Laura. Thank you. And then uh, as we can imagine, the, the nice things about using the circling uh, process is that the tuning is based on the objective functions, which is um, you know, the, the smallest uh, RMS uh, ARS and, and also largest um, uh, correlation coefficient. And then the DA, DNA, DNA neural network you know, is able to predict, uh, have a better predictions on the wave energy period and also wave height, much better than typically uh, conventionally used the statistical models. The, uh, the figure on the right shows some of the model performance because you're looking into a short-term forecast into the future. So we are looking at uh, for the x-axis, this is the lead time in hours from hour one all the way to hour 12. And, and then we can look at uh, the model performance in terms of the uh, correlation coefficient. So as time goes on, the, uh, the correlation degrades as, um, as we know, but uh, you know, for the first three to six hours, the performance is actually very good. So both for the significant wave height, wave period, and, and also wave energies. So the, the, the idea is um, this uh, neural, neural network based model has a really 
uh, get the potentials to be used for forecasting uh, the wave parameters and wave energies. And um, they also did mention that, that such performance has you know, sensitivities to different time of the years. And winter is rough time, and uh, there's so much more dynamic ocean environment. Wind are stronger, waves are high. So they do notice that um, there's a larger uncertainty uh, in the winter times than in the summertime. But overall, this model gave uh, a pretty nice um, directions in, term of, in terms of using the AI and machine learning method to, to do better predictions uh, that can be utilized to uh, uh, help with wave energy extraction. Next slide. Back to Laura. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next topic that we're going to cover is hurricane intensity forecasts. And this is a really important topic because the better we can predict hurricane intensity, um, the better we can prepare for when they're going to make a landfall, we'll know when to evacuate and that can save a lot of lives. Um, so there's been tremendous progress in improving uh, TC track forecasts, a tropical cyclone track forecast, intensity has still been very difficult to forecast, especially uh, something that's called rapid intensification, which is defined as a 24 hour sustained wind increase of over 30 knots. And this is one of the top priorities for the National Hurricane Center to improve these predictions. Now, the paper that we're about to talk about uh, is going to look at using precipitation as an indicator because we have satellites such as the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission that can provide rainfall info that's associated with tropical storms. So the paper uh, that we're highlighting here is Sue et al. 2020, and they are demonstrating the use of satellite observations of storm internal structures to predict hurricane intensification using a machine learning model. Uh, so here on the right is their sort of demonstration that you can use precipitation to predict uh, if a storm is going to intensify or not. So this is a composite sur maps of surface precipitation. These are maps from 1998 to 2014. And all of the storms here are classified into uh, different intensities and different strengthenings. So from top to bottom, you've got your tropical depressions, your tropical storms, your category one and two hurricanes, and then finally your major hurricanes. And as you go left to right, uh, we can see that they have different classifications of whether they're weakening or intensifying. Here, they're weakening if over 24 hours, um, the sustained wind speed has dropped by more than five knots. A neutral is if it's only changed within five knots within a 24 hour period. Slowly intensifying is a pretty big category. So it's um, from five to 30 knots intensifying over a 24 hour period. And that rapidly intensifying, that's that greater than 30 knots over a 24 hour period. And you can see that there's a very definable pattern here in the storm precipitation patterns. That means that a neural network can be trained to recognize these patterns. So what Sue and all are adding is that they are looking at the use of a surplus precipitation rate to predict intensification. And this surplus precipitation uh, is the mean precipitation rate in the inner storm within 100 kilometers of the storm center minus the inner core precipitation rate for a neutral tropical cyclone of the same intensity. So if it hadn't intensified, what would the precipitation be? So they're training a neural network to predict the hurricane intensity and the rapid in intensification uh, from the images of the precipitation as long as, along with a few other uh, predictors. So what they have contributed is they uh, contributed the Machine Learning Hurricane Intensity Forecast Scheme, or ML.HIFS, which is an ensemble of a bunch of different machine learning methods, logistic regression, random forest, decision tree, and extra tree models. And this ensemble outputs a, a rapid instance case a rapid intensification classifier and the probability of intensification. And so they train this ensemble um, with, with and without the surplus precipitation as a predictor, uh, just to see if surplus precipitation will be an important predictor. So on to some results. Just to orient you to this figure on the right, the top row is for predictions for the Atlantic and the bottom is a row is for the Eastern Pacific. Um, so these are for three different rapid intensification thresholds, 25 knots, 30 knots, and 35 knots. Gray is the operational National Hurricane Center RI consensus. 
Blue is their ensemble model from the paper that was trained with just the same operational values uh, or the same um, predictors that are used in the NHC model. And then the red is their ensemble uh, with all those predictors plus surplus, surplus precipitation. So what they find is that their machine learning model performs well in both the Atlantic and the Eastern North Pacific. And um, their ensemble outperforms the NHC consensus forecast for all RI thresholds in the Atlantic. So there's the most improvement in the Atlantic. Uh, they note that in the Atlantic basin, um, the machine learning, their machine learning ensemble with the surplus precipitation uh, exceeds operational consensus by 37%, 12%, and 138% for each threshold in the Pierce skill score. Um, and they uh, note that their probability of detection is much higher, 40%, uh, 60%, and 200% relatively. And they get all of this improvement with only a little bit of increase in the false alarm ratio, so 4%, 7%, and 6% respectively. Uh, there is a small relative improvement also seen in the Eastern North Pacific, but uh, the Atlantic was really where they had most of their improvements. So they are showing that this machine learning ensemble is a really important tool to add to a forecaster's, uh, a, a forecaster's toolbox, basically, to predict whether a storm is going to intensify rapidly or not. And with that, I will pass it back over to Roy. Great, thanks, Laura. So the next topic is also a very big, um research area in oceanography, focusing, focusing on the, um, the carbon flux. So um, in this case, we we'll focus on the ocean PCO2 uh, data sets. And as we know that ocean is a, a major modulator in, in the global scale of the carbon uh, single source budget. And oceans uh, is absorbing or releasing atmosphere carbon uh, at different time, different locations around the globe. So it is very important to be able to quantify uh, the concentration, the PCO2 in the ocean, uh, so we can better understand the climate change. And um, as we have you know, more and more oceanic PCO2 measurements, uh, we're still facing lots of gap, both in time and space. So we are still undersampling the system, especially in the coastal ocean environment. So, um, the, the idea here is can we de derive a methodology uh, using existing observations, some models, and also machine learning and AI technology to start building the climatological uh, basis for the PCO2, from which we can then start assess the uh, long-term variabilities and climate change impact. Next slide, please. So in this case, um, the paper published back in 2017 by Laurel, uh, use a machine learning uh, technology to, to achieve this goal. So in this case, um, we can see that um, they are using a self-organizing map. So to first derive the coastal areas into a biogeochemistry provinces based on their uh, specific uh, physical and biogeochemical characteristics. And then for each province, then they use a feed-forward network to produce a monthly PCO2 maps. So in this case, they're using, you know, in situ observations from a, a database called SOTAT, which is a in situ um, uh, ocean carbon uh, measurement database. And, and then uh, they're using this database to train the, uh, the neural network individually for each different uh, provinces. And, and then they also validate the results using um, some independent observation database available at uh, Columbia University Lamont. So uh, the predictors for the neural network, uh, including sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface salinity, basimetry, sea ice, the chlorophyll, uh, wind speed, and wind direction. Next slide, please. Oops. Okay, so this is some results from their paper. So. Um, as you can see, the analysis was done over the global, uh, global ocean. And um, what they were able to generate using such an approach is a quarter degree global monthly PCO2 uh, database cover the time period from 1998 to uh, 2015. And um, they are focused a lot on the coastal, coastal carbon uh, PCO2 distribution because this is the place uh, where 
the dynamic processes uh, processes are most complex to understand. And um, what we found was the spatial distributions of each individual uh, provinces are mostly dependent upon the latitude and also the distance from the coast, uh, as well as uh, the time. So months by months, they, they also have a different uh, distributions. But uh, the algorithm is, is able to handle such diverse uh, variations uh, in space and time. And, and then they are able to generate such ontologies uh, for the global oceans. So they have some uh, statistical measurements looking to the uh, RMSE root mean square uh, era, which is uh, less than 40 parts per million uh, for the coastal uh, PCO2 uh, climatology, climatological uh, measurements. They argued that, that this number is still relatively high than the wanted. Um, so they are still you know, more efforts, more rooms for improvement, uh, for further uh, research. Uh, again, this is a very important uh, research topic to be able to start the uh, start quantify and budget uh, the carbon uh, on the global scale. And um, the coast ocean is the key to be able to balance the budget. So they have this open database available uh, online. And um, we thought this is a, a very useful and valuable research using machine learning and AI approach to address this important carbon research. Okay, move on to uh, next section by Laura. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so our next section is going to cover hypoxia. So hypoxia is a condition um, where the water has a low dissolved oxygen concentration. And that's a major concern in coastal waters um, because as you can imagine, if you are an aquatic organism and there's not terribly much oxygen in the water, um, that's going to be a really bad time. Um, so hypoxia, some of the dangers associated with it are the mortality of these aquatic organisms. They change biogeochemical cycles. They alter the ecosystem community and they can reduce fisheries yield. So it's a pretty important problem. And we have some uh, major hypoxic areas seasonally that are actually pretty close to us. We've got the Chesapeake Bay and the Northern Gulf of Mexico among others. Um, so hypoxic events have gotten worse in the recent decades. And that's due to various nutrient loadings uh, from agricultural practices among others, to climate change and the change in physical conditions. And these have made hypoxic conditions worse. So, um, the paper that we're going to highlight here is the U at All 2020, and they are using buoy data in the Chesapeake Bay to train a model to predict dissolved oxygen in the water. So uh, their uh, breakdown of how they did this is here in this figure on the right. So first, the dissolved and oxygen anomaly is decomposed via EOF analysis into its spatial and its temporal components. And then for each principal component, they train a neural network with input forcings, and their forcings are uh, NO3 in the nutrients, air temperature, river flow, solar radiation, wind speed, and wind direction. They test a number of different neural ne network architectures to find the best model. Uh, they ended up testing multiple linear regression, decision trees, Bayesian regression, and a neural network. So some of their results here, uh, the results here that I'm showing are the plots from uh, their, their training data. They also have a pretty robust uh, test data set um, that also shows a uh, very high R values. I just prefer this figure, which is why I'm showing it. So the model training results show a high R squared value, a low RMSE and high model skill for each EOF mode, which shows that the model is performing quite well. Um, the observed versus the model time series of the first two EOF modes do agree quite well. And the second mode uh, has some higher standard deviation than the first mode. So the first mode is performing better. Just to give you an example uh, of how the model is performing, here on the right, you're looking at the vertical profile of the summer mean dissolved oxygen concentration, which is averaged over June through August. And going uh, as you go from the top to the bottom, you're going down through the years along the base mainstream, starting at 2010 and then going down to 2015. The observations on the left and the model is on the right. Um, and those red areas are, those are the danger areas. That's where you have low dissolved oxygen. And we can see that there's pretty good agreement. Here on the right, you're looking at a seasonal comparison between the observed uh, dissolved oxygen concentration on the left and the model dissolved oxygen concentration on the right along the bay's mainstream. And we can see here too, that the model is doing a pretty good job of predicting dissolved oxygen. Um, so this is an illustration 
uh, that machine learning methods can be used to predict dissolved oxygen and hypoxic areas, which can be better used for managing in, uh, these environmental conditions. And with that, I will turn it back over to Roy. Great, thanks, Laura. So the next topic is also um, very important, especially in the summer season. So lots of people are you know, spending time on the beach and um, having a fun in the ocean. But then there's a major issue, safety issue, um, relates to the reef current. So now a scientist uh, made lots of efforts. Actually, this is uh, one of the major highlights of this year. So now is making the reef current forecasting, which is based on the machine learning and AI technology uh, into operations. So the, in the US, um, there's ongoing operations to help detect the reef currents to save lives. So um, just to put some background, so predicting reef current is extremely difficult because the conditions is very um, location dependent and it's very difficult to develop a universal methodologies to, uh, to uh, forecasting reef currents uh, all everywhere <laughs> around the nation or in the world. But there's a major societal impact. So if we're not careful, the reef currents can cause lives, right? And, um, and we're talking about um, in US alone, more than close to 40,000 beach rescues uh, occurred due to the reef current um, uh, impact. So then the efforts here in this paper is using machine learning and, and also um, in conjunction with existing coastal web camera image and video clips to identify the reef currents and, and then broadcasting that information to the public. So next slide. So this is a paper. Um, so by uh, Dee Sylvia and also uh, Greg, uh, Greg Dusek uh, from NOAA and also their colleagues. And the paper was published in Coastal Engineering uh, this year. So what uh, these colleagues did was to use the, the image, the still image and also the video clips uh, collected by the Google Earth. So then they are able to label the images, uh, for example, the, the one showing in the lower left corner uh, to, to train the model. So they actually have lots of image, in this case, uh, several thousands images that shows either with the rip, uh, rip current or without the rip current. And then they're using this, this database uh, to run through a fast region-based convolutionary neural network. And um, if you look at the flow chart uh, at the bottom of the slide, you will see that all the images went to the CNN and then they are, they are being diagnosed and be classified. So the output of the, the analysis uh, has two components. One is the classification. So whether this is a, there's a rip current or not. And, and also uh, the second output is on the, the spatial dimensions. So they produce this output image uh, in the far right, which really start to highlight the bounding box of, um, uh, of the rip current inside the image. And, and this is information now they can broadcast to the community and uh, alert people not go to go into the region that has this bounding box uh, where the rip current is occurring. So very uh, important work and, and also uh, extremely uh, timely efforts uh, to serve the society, uh, especially in the summer season. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, another results in your paper. So what um, what uh, this images set of images shows is uh, a comparison uh, between the real world images and and then and also the output from their uh, CN neural network. So the blue box. In some of the images uh, where we have the rip current occurrence are the, the truth, ground truth. So this is um, you know, identified by a human expert. And the red box uh, is the uh, machine learning, the CNA neural network uh, output. So you can see that uh, the results agree with each other quite nicely. And um, the, the CN uh, model is running real time in that case, um, the, the look at uh, the accuracies between a human expert <laughs> I identified uh, rip current events versus the new machine learning identified uh, results. They see that machine learning approach is actually much more accurate and, and also much more efficient. So we are having a close to like a one uh, uh, a point nine eight accuracy 
as opposed to human, which is only uh, 0.76. And um, this has become really a, um, uh, a very useful approach, uh, both uh, very accurate and, and also efficient, and it's being applied uh, around uh, many beaches in the nation. So a uh, big kudos to our NOAA colleagues for this research and um, thank them for their contributions to address this very uh, important societal needs. Next slide. Oh, okay, so my turn again. So in this case, we start talking about our own research and um, one of our research um, program in the lab is to study the mesoscale ocean eddies. In this case, our focus is on the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, the image on the right shows a very strong currents. Um, the color shading here is the speed of the ocean current. So as you can see that uh, uh, from the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, there's a very strong current called loop current, which is making this uh, clockwise rotation. But the circulation, because, because of its high speed, oftentimes it's become unsteady. So that's why you, 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 have, um, the, you have this eddy shading process, which is highlighted in the lower uh, figure. So in this case, you have this huge eddy, which has a diameter about two to 300 kilometers. And, and also the, the swelling speed is about close to two meters per second. And this eddy will start to moving from east to west and uh, impacting the Gulf white circulation, biogeochemical properties, fish lobby transport, earth interactions, hurricanes. Uh, what's more is, um, as we know, there are lots of uh, oil and uh, gas drilling platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're talking about more than 4,000 of them. So every time when this larger scale ocean that is moving closer and closer to the drilling platforms, they cause strong vibrations and um, they have a strong safety implications. So for, for decades, uh, there are strong needs uh, from the society ask, can, can scientists make a long-term predictions on the loop current eddy shedding process? By long term, people are looking for three months in advance. Can we tell the community, the stakeholders, what's going to happen in 90 to 100 days? Will there be a eddy shedding and how strong and where are they? And this is, has been a very difficult uh, scientific problem to deal with because of nonlinearities and, and also the loop current has very complex phases. Next slide, please. So what we have been doing here is to use um, uh, the, um, the self-organizing map to first cluster different loop current phases. Uh, and then this is based on satellite observed the sea surface height database, which uh, now has a several decades of time series, which we can use to do the classifications. And then we have another uh, efforts using the um, neural network to train uh, the a model, which uh, is then used to do the long-term forecast of the loop current and loop current eddy shedding. So details are given in these two papers. And um, the next slide, please, Laura, I'm just going to highlight the, the idea. So the idea here is actually pretty simple. So we have a, you know, three decades long sea surface height measurements uh, from the satellite altimetry. So what happened is each of the loop current eddy, they have a um, higher sea level signature. So by identifying the high sea level, the dome of the, the sea level, you can start to delineate the boundary of the loop current. So we are using the, the Gulf white sea surface height measurement from satellite altimetry, which is you know, 30 years long. And first step is to do a EUF analysis. So we can decompose this three dimensional X, Y, and T data set into a time component, principal component, and, and also a, a spatial dependent UFs. Okay, so assumption here, it's a spatial UF will stay constant, will stay the same for, for the future times. But the time, the PC component uh, is, uh, is varying variables. And that's something we can uh, inject into the neural network. And we can use historical PCs to predict the uh, future PCs, okay? And once you have the future prism, prism component, you can reconstruct the future sea surface height 
by multiplying the predicted uh, PCs and, and also the um, existing uh, spatial UFs. So once you have the future uh, sea surface height reconstructions, then you can start to draw the boundaries of the loop current, determine the timings of the eddy shedding. Next slide. So this is a figure showing uh, one example. So we're talking about um, a future hang, a few future forecast, right? So three weeks into future, four weeks, five weeks, and six weeks into the future. So the upper row here, this is a, a based on the prediction from the neural network. And the lower panels here are the, the ground truthing observation independent satellite sea surface height measurements that uh, we didn't you know, consider in the training, uh, but just left them out uh, for, the, for the validation purpose. So if you look at them, the week by week snapshots, we can see that uh, there's a, a a very uh, consistent agreement, especially in the first few weeks. And uh, if you move to week five and week six, we still see um, uh, many uh, agreements and also the timings of the eddy shedding. So the idea here is, again, it's a very powerful approach that uh, can probably uh, addressing the limits of conventional ocean modeling uh, by, by using the big data and also machine learning approach to address uh, such a nonlinear geophysical circulation processes. So uh, lots of efforts still ongoing as part of uh, our AI to ES effort. So we're looking forward to report more results in future events. Next slide, I think that's your Laura. It is, thank you so much. Uh, and so I will be uh, closing out our talk today with some of my ongoing research. Um, and this is uh, a paper that's in preparation and hopefully coming soon to a journal near you. So the goal of this research is to understand the interrelationship between physical and biological and chemical ocean variables. And that's things like sea surface temperature, chlorophyll concentrations, particulate organic carbon, and particulate inorganic carbon. And we know that all of these variables have relations and we want to understand them better how they interact out in the coastal and the global ocean. Now, here's the problem, is that on this large scale of, say, the uh, East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico in the United States, um, we're using MODA satellite data, and our view of the ocean is often hindered by clouds. So this is a pretty cloudy region, uh, and that's illustrated by this figure on the right here. So you're, uh, you're looking at the percentage of available data from the 1st of January 2003 to 31st of December in 2020. And the most data that we have available is the sea surface temperature, which has only up to 60% available data for any given grid cell. Uh, and things like chlorophyll, PIC, and POC have a maximum of 30 to 35% available data over this time period. Uh, so that's uh, sort of getting in the way of understanding how these variables relate to one another. Um, so this has been an ongoing field of research and uh, my contribution is to use machine learning to reconstruct a robust cloud-free time series of the data. So can a machine learning model learn to predict what would be underneath those clouds at that given time? So we're training this model and then we're combining the trained model prediction with the original images to produce a merged product. And so that will be a tool for us to understand uh, these relations much better. So as I mentioned, we're, uh, the goal is to create a cloud-free time series of four variables in the US East Coast and Gulf of Mexico. And that sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, particulate organic carbon, and particulate inorganic carbon. This is going to have a 12 kilometer resolution and our period of interest is 2003 to 2020. Um, so the first step, we're training a convolutional neural network called DENK to reconstruct that cloud-free time series. We validate the model and combine the original satellite image with the reconstruction to create the merged product, and then we're investigating the relationships. So DINK is not a model that I developed. All the credit to developing it goes to Alex Barth and his team, and it's described in a paper, uh, Barth et al. 2020. I've included the GitHub link here in case you want to go check it out. It's a really great model, so I do recommend it. And the aim when they were creating this model was to create a reconstruction strategy that can cope with really large amounts of missing data. And it's done in an analogous way to data assimilation in numerical models. So the model itself has three phases. It's got a data pre-processing phase, a training phase, and then it has a reconstruction phase. It's written in TensorFlow 1.15, so it's pretty easy to set up. Um, and if you have Python knowledge, then you're solid. 
So here on the right, you're seeing a table of all of the steps in DINK. It is a convolutional neural network. It has a number of different layers, which really help with reconstructing. So uh, one of the things that happens when, at least for us, when we've been using this convolutional neural network is that it requires a massive amount of GPU memory. And so in order to reduce some of those memory requirements, we've subsampled our original data from four kilometers to 12 kilometers uh, so that we don't put as much strain on the GPU memory. Before we gave the uh, model any data, we transformed chlorophyll, PIC, and POC by the natural log. This is because DINK is expecting to have um, data that has a Gaussian distribution. And so we wanna make sure that this data is transformed so that DINK can work with it. Uh, then once DINK has the data, uh, it does its own pre-processing. It subtracts the time averages from the variables just so that you have the anomaly, and then it scales it by the inverse of the error variance. Here on the right, you're looking at um, all of the inputs that DINK is using to reconstruct uh, what's happening underneath the clouds. And the most important one is the variable anomaly scale by the inverse of the error variance. So it's taking, if you're trying to predict chlorophyll, say, you're giving it um, the chlorophyll data, it's taking the variable anomalies and then trying to predict um, that based on what has been there before. It also takes, for any given grid cell, it takes what was happening the day before and what was happening the day after at that point as inputs. So in that manner, it helps to give you some continuity. So you don't have really strong gradients that would be unrealistic in your model. So our validation and testing data. So um, the testing data, which here I'm defining as the data that you set aside so that you can tune your model parameters. Um, that is done within DINK, which is a really nice feature. So during each reconstruction phase, DINK masks a different set of data each time, and it calculates the RMSE uh, for that mass data. This allows you to tune your model properly. Now we um, separated our own validation data set uh, and it's done in the same method as Barth et al. 2020. This is data that the model never sees. So this is how we are validating our model. How we've done this is the cloud cover from the first 50 images is extracted and applied to the last 50 images. So the data that is masked is taken completely out. We withhold that from the model uh, and that is our validation data set. So that gives us over 100,000 data points to work with. Um, we're also doing some uh, some in situ independent validation. Um, we have buoys uh, for sea surface temperature for in situ validation. We are looking for more POC and PIC in situ data sets. So if you have a favorite one that's citable, uh, if you want to drop that in Slido, uh, and I will cite it in my paper. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, looking at the temporal mean of our data. Um, so this is chlorophyll, PIC, POC, and sea surface temperature, the temporal means for each one. Uh, and you will note here uh, the values, the chlorophyll, the PIC, and POC have been transformed by the natural log. So this is the average that we're aiming for. Now going into some of the validation results. So here you're looking at our validation data um, in the observations on the x-axis plotted against the model reconstruction on the y-axis. Um, so each of those have been plotted against one another and a regression line has been plotted on that. And we've got uh, several different statistics here, the R value, RMSE, slope, and intercept. Uh, so this is for chlorophyll and sea surface temperature. Uh, and we can see that it's performing quite well for each of these. The R values are quite high for both chlorophyll and sea surface temperature. RMSE is staying pretty low. Um, and all this looks pretty good. Now for PIC and POC, um, the model is not quite doing as well. Uh, it has a larger spread. R values are lower at 0.82 and 0.88 respectively. Um, it's still better than any other model I've tried, so I'm quite happy with it. Um, so we're still looking for some improvements. Um, our RMSE is 0.8 and 0.4, uh, for six respectively. So um, that is how the model is performing right now. If we look at um, the RMSE, the average RMSE between the validation data and the reconstruction, uh, and we look at it based on latitude and longitude, we see that there are some areas where uh, the model is having more difficulty. That tends to be up in the Gulf of Maine and uh, the Mid-Atlantic Bight. And that is the area where if you look on uh, the left here, that's where we have in general less cloud data. 
Um, so there's less data there to work with. So the model is having more trouble in those areas. Uh, and so my last slide for this is um, just so that you can see how different this is. So on the top, we've got validation images. This is uh, one day of what the satellite is actually seeing for chlorophyll, PIC, POC, and SST. And on the bottom is our merged product. Um, it's those images plus our reconstruction. And so that is what we are aiming for. And with that, I will hand it back over to Roy. Thank you so much. Great, well, thanks, Laura. So in summary, so we, we here presented uh, several cases, uh, case studies on AI applications in coastal and large scale oceanographies. And we want to just uh, share our excitement. I think uh, there's uh, strong potentials, lots of potentials for AI and uh, machine learnings in oceanographies. One thing we didn't touch upon in today's presentation is how we can best link AI and ML with ocean modeling. And uh, this is such a um, important area, and but also a very new area. Uh, so again, this is gonna be part of our efforts to pursue in the AI to ES. So machine learning and AI can be used to improve the fidelity and the computing efficiency of the model, can also be used to QA, QC, the input data, do the feature extractions and extreme events predictions, but, but can also be used to produce many uh, value-added uh, machine science products. So just uh, you know, very excited about the time and also excited about the collaborations. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to more discussions and collaborations. Thanks all. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Roy and Laura, for that really interesting talk and for sharing all those important applications of trustworthy AI and coastal and ocean, uh, coastal and ocean mo modeling. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions. Um, Laura, here's one for you. How does your deep learning framework, NK, deal with missing input data in different locations at different times? So how does it deal with it um, by which you, by which perhaps we mean, um, how does it deal with it? Um, do you mean like if you don't have an input, uh, how does it? Right. Like how do you uh, still make a prediction? Right. Uh, so it. My apologies. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm a little confused on the phrasing of the question. Yeah, the machine learning model essentially it's mm -hmm. uh, it's learning, it's using existing data to build the the memory, the knowledge between mm -hmm. say the, the the location and time where you do have observations, with other time and locations where you do not. So so that connection, intrinsic connection. It's essentially learned and generated by the machine learning approach. So, so in this case, so in, imagine this is a smart extrapolator built by the machine that can be used to fill the, the data gaps. Great, thank you. Now here's one for you, Roy. How fast can machine learning techniques use camera-based observations? As some of these rip currents can be ephemeral and deadly in that short amount of time, can neural networks provide a solution quickly or real time so that rescue can be attempted in time? I think I think that's a goal. Um, I really hope uh, Greg Greg is here, who is a leading uh, now scientist on this effort. So I, I think because the product is now operational, uh, which uh, you know meets real time demand to be able to deliver the real time uh, guidance on the rip current prediction. So I would think everything's real time, very fast, and they've been doing this for years and uh, the product is operational now. Great, thank you. So next question for Laura, um, what machine are you training your model on? Since you mentioned reducing data resolution to accommodate memory constraint, it'd be good to reference if you could provide major machine specifications. Yeah, so we had originally been training on NC State's high powered computing system. Um, and uh, we were using an RTX 2080 GPU, uh, which didn't quite have um, enough power that we needed. And so uh, we took it over to AWS. Uh, and Roy, do you know what specifications we were able to achieve over on AWS? I, I think that unfortunately the performance is about the same as our ah, yeah. state computer, yeah. But, but then as part of the ai to es Institute, I know Amy, uh, you were able to get uh, a much better computing platforms. So we're looking forward to, to use that to rerun the system and uh, building up a more uh, performance matrix. They are live as of 
yesterday or the day before, we have 10 A100s up and running. Yeah, so that's going to be the state of state of the art system. We're looking forward to try. All right, it is the top of the, the hour. Um, Roy, Laura, you had a robust set of questions on Slido, so perhaps you can answer some of the remaining questions there. And for everyone else, we'll take a, a five minute break and see you in five minutes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
All right. Um, I take it uh, that uh, I hope everybody's back and uh, you're settling in and ready for a great last hour. And uh, so the, for the last hour of, of our summer school, we uh, so decided to look at the bottom line. We want our methods uh, to be operational. We want them to be used by, the, by everybody, by the public and for the betterment of, of, of society. And so this is the, the topic of our last, uh, of our last segment. Uh, we have uh, three speakers. Uh, we'll have first uh, Dr. John Williams, who's part of the AI2ES leadership. He's, uh, and he's also a senior scientist for machine learning and a senior manager, a senior manager for forecasting sciences at the weather company and IBM business. Uh, we'll have um, Dr. Sue Holt, and uh, Dr. Holt is an NCAR senior scientist and the deputy director of for research applications laboratory at NCAR and uh, Jeb Stewart, who's the lead of the informatics and visualization branch for the NOAA Global System Laboratory in uh, Boulder, Colorado. So they will share with you uh, viewpoints R2O from the industry side, national app side, academic side, and then we'll have a fireside chat. And we'll start with John. John, take it away. Thank you very much, Philippe. And yes, I am John Williams from the Weather Company and IBM Business. And it's uh, an honor to be with you today to provide my perspective as someone working in industry on AI research to operations. So first, what do we mean by AI R2O? To me, AI R2O means leveraging AI-based methods as components of automated systems or workflows that operate routinely and are used for a business government entertainment or educational purpose. There are many other great reasons to do AI in the weather and climate space, including satisfying curiosity, gaining knowledge, or just because it's really fun. But R2O is an important way that the rubber meets the road to deliver value to society, creating broader impacts from our work and ideally helping to make the world a better place. So AI R2O for weather applications spans a broad value chain from foundational weather data on the left to actionable weather content on the right. AI is used as you've heard over the last four days and observation sensors and networks and their quality control for accelerating and improving numerical weather prediction models for model post-processing and data fusion to create forecasts and nowcasts and for translations of weather to impacts that matter to people, and ultimately for decision services that help people decide how to act. In industry, a fundamental motivation for AI R2O is of course that it provides a powerful way to transform the deluge of data that we have in our, our modern times into actionable insights. For a business like IBM and our clients, AI-based systems help us grow revenue, efficiency, and profit, differentiate from the competition, enhance our brand, satisfy customer needs, help people make better decisions at the end of the day. And while the profit motive is obviously important in industry, I think there is an increasing sentiment in corporations and certainly in those of us working in industry that really our ultimate goal is to benefit society and the planet. Unfortunately, most AI R2O efforts are not successful. An article from VentureBeat a couple of years ago highlighted the sad statistic that 87% of data science projects never make it into production. Or said another way, only one in eight data science R2O efforts is successful. And while this article focuses on AI and business, it raises the question, what about government R2O or academic AI R2O as well? I suspect the fraction of academic AI projects that make it into operations is even lower than this one out of eight, since publications are often the primary goal and metric for success in academia. But I can't help thinking about all the great innovation in our universities and labs that never makes the uh, contribution, the contribution to society that it could. And I wonder if multi-sector collaboration like what we're undertaking in AI2ES could help model a way to change the situation and improve it. So what goes wrong in AI R2O or said differently, what is the path to success? Notionally, I 
suspect that only a fraction of AI data science projects are really addressing a priority business need so that the cost of operationalization turns out to merit the benefits represented here in the blue bar. Of those that do, only a fraction turn out to have access to the data required to really solve the problem. That's shown here in yellow. And of those, only a fraction perform adequately to provide users what they want or need. And only a fraction of those have the organizational buy-in to provide the resources needed to deploy and sustain the production system. If we can figure out how to increase these fractions, we can make AI R2O much more efficient and garner more of its promise. So my thesis is that the AI weather enterprise can vastly enhance our benefit to society by intentionally directing R2O efforts toward end user needs, establishing their trustworthiness and practical value, and including end-to-end -end design from the start of the project. And by the way, infusing this approach in academic AI uh, projects can enhance their broader impacts and also help prepare the future workforce for positions in industry and elsewhere. So let's walk, walk through three of these elements of successful AI R2O. First, it's important to make sure that the project is solving a real user need. To do this, it's important to engage stakeholders and end users from the start of the project. At IBM, we use something called design thinking. I think that's broadly used uh, in the industry. That helps think through uh, these problems systematically, including involving sponsor users from our clients and customer advisory boards. And I think one of the really exciting elements of the AI2AS Institute is the involvement of social scientists who can also really help us address this, making sure we're satisfying user needs. If possible, rapid prototyping is really helpful since it allows you to quickly build a minimum viable product and then iterate with the user to tweak and tune it, rather than building a monolithic system for perhaps over several years that at the end of the day may turn out not to address user needs when it's done. Getting that constant feedback can really help you meet the target in the end. This process should involve asking lots of questions and listening carefully to the answers, including who is the intended customer or user or persona? What end user operational problem do they want you to solve? What will they consider to be a trustworthy solution? As an example, one of our AI2ES colleagues was approached by a large auto manufacturer uh, who we had a few meetings with, and it turned out they wanted to know when to move or cover the new cars that were waiting for transportation outside their plant. And what they needed was really a reliable, probabilistic, hourly point location forecast of damaging hail that they could use to make cost loss decisions about whether the risk of hail merited the cost of moving or protecting the cars. So um, the Institute sponsored a couple of summer REU students uh, who have made good progress on this very specific challenging problem with that uh, end user in mind. Number two, one of the themes of the summer school uh, has been that we need to establish the trustworthy and value of the AI solution. Uh, and here, I think the reproducibility crisis that has been documented, particularly in the social sciences with only 40% of published experimental results being reproducible is important to keep in mind. The AI system needs to perform well, not just in the training and demo phases, but for the long term. So we need to evaluate performance and generalizability with care. And this includes using user relevant metrics, being careful about hidden training and testing set correlations, which can easily sneak into weather data sets, fairly comparing the proposed method to simpler, credible alternatives. You want to make sure that's not just the calibration step that's responsible for the improved performance, for instance. Account for data latency that you'll face in a real-time implementation. And ideally, run your algorithm in an actual or simulated real-time mode, including any automated retraining that's needed to keep performance high and avoid model drift. 
That adds a lot of complexity, but also a lot of robustness to the solution. Also, throughout all of this, carefully weigh complexity, computational and maintenance burdens. The 80-20 rule often applies here, a solution that is 80% of optimal, but requires only 20% of the time or resources is often the preferred solution, at least in industry. And finally, let's go to number three. Think about the deployed systems designed from the start of the project. Will the required data be available? We need a data stream for operations, not just a data set. There are a lot of ways the data can be interrupted or corrupted, so we may need automated data QC and strategies for when a data source may be missing. Where will the software run? Are adequate resources available to implement and sustain a production system? How will the systems be monitored? Who will maintain the systems? Will automated retraining be necessary? And how will you do QC of the retrained model to make sure it works well before making it the production model? Do you wanna share your software and make it open source and allow others to contribute and improve the solution? And you wanna use microservices, containerization to allow for, for more smoother hybrid cloud implementation that can simplify deployment, maintenance, and opportunities for others to use your software. So in summary, I've given you obviously a very high level and vastly simplified and incomplete summary of some of the issues with AI R2O and some suggestions on how to address them. The bottom line is that I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve R2O, particularly in multi-sector collaborations like those being fostered by the AI2ES Institute. I think that being thoughtful and intentional about R2O from the start of an AI project can vastly enhance the impact of the AI weather enterprise on society. And with that, I'll stop and I look forward to hearing my colleagues' perspectives from academia and government and hearing your thoughts and questions during the fireside chat. Super, Th thank you very much for, for your thoughts from uh, the IBM and uh, the uh, private sector perspective. And now Sue's gonna share her, her thoughts. Uh, she has a lot of experience. She's been at the heart of, uh, of AI and AI R2O, both in uh, the private, both in uh, academia and the national labs. Uh, take it away, Sue. Thank you, Philippe. And John, that was a great talk. Lots of wonderful points that you made that I'll reiterate many of them. Um, first of all, I do want to point out that NCAR is not an operational center. We're a research organization. We consider ourselves part of the academic sector. Our role is to do the research, basic to applied, to gather the community to produce products that then can be operationalized. Now, in doing that, we often run some test products quasi-operationally and deal with many of the same issues that John just pointed out are important in the private sector as well. Now, I do want to point out that you know, one of our um, strengths is community gathering and that it really does take a community to make R2O work well. And as John pointed out, you have to start with the end user. The end user has a need. You need to understand that. The basic research community has done some great artificial intelligence research, but they may be really far removed from those end user needs. The applied research community may help get somewhere, uh, you know, a little bit closer, but it's not quite enough. Now, oftentimes you need a funding organization to kind of spur this forward, uh, then come in the operations, monitoring, computing, and don't forget the stage of translation, turning it into something that the end user can actually use. Now, we had an opportunity to do such a, a project uh, a few years back on solar power forecasting. Where in, in this case, the end user were groups of utilities and independent system operators. The funding organization in this case was DOE's Sunshot organization, and we formed a public-private academic partnership. 
where we brought in the basic research community, um, as well as applied research, other national labs, university partners, NOAA was involved. We used their data, they were doing parallel research in what they could see as operationalizing. But then we also included several private sector entities who deliver forecasts in real time to groups like these end users. This, the, the result was what we called the sun forecast system. Now, when we first got the group together for our first workshop some time ago, the first thing we did was have a panel of the end users listen to what they needed. Now we knew that weather happens and in the case of solar power forecasting, it's clouds and aerosols that, ex that obscure the insulation. But what the user wants out is they wanna know their changes in production costs and their reserve analysis to deal with these issues. So we, formed a value chain, much as John just showed, where we're going to have to do this monitoring, modeling, turning it into a forecast, disseminating it both area and point, looking at converting into quantities that are of more relevance to the user, interpreting it into things like power production, uh, load balancing, so that we can come out with forecasts for day ahead planning, real time operations. So the end user can make decisions on how to allocate their units and estimate their reserve requirements. And the system that we came up is flow charted here. You see that we have a lot of models flowing into the system, model data, observations, real time meta observations, and the Parts of the system that use AI are highlighted in red here. And you see there's various real important components, including die cast, uh, the engine that blends the data and the model information trained to historical observations. But we were also doing real-time forecasting for grid integration for those first six hours. So there were several AI methods there. Because the output was probabilistic power, we ended up doing power conversions and using an analog ensemble, another AI method, to do that probabilistic component. We found that this, uh, this system was successful, but as we looked at it, of course, there are improvements. Now, some things that I wanna point out, one of the biggest issues is that flow of real-time data and making it appropriately match the historic data that you have trained your system to. Oftentimes, those system, the, those data are disparate. You have to consider that. It happens in large volume. Some of that needs processed in real time. The data are complex. These are the big data issues that we also deal with. The format matting differences between have to be dealt with. We have to have really robust historic data sets for training. Oftentimes there's insufficient metadata that we have to deal with as well as disparate averaging times. You know, for instance, sometimes if we wanna do 15 minute averaging data are averaged so that it's centered at the top of the hour, that means that you can't even issue a forecast or begin processing until seven and a half minutes after the hour. Instead, one can look at data that is averaged more toward the top of the hour or the top of the period. These sorts of considerations all take time. Data timestamp issues, you wouldn't believe how much of an issue that can be in getting your data right. Is it UTC or is it really local time? How do they deal with changes from daylight savings uh, to standard time and back? And how are you going to deal with it in your system? What if your you have data that crosses time zones? How is that handled? And you can say, sure, let's just do everything in UTC, but the data from the end user that you're getting may not be that way, and they may not even understand what it really is. 
Sometimes you don't have enough data, you have to deal with quality control. All these issues impact cost, your frustration in building the system and can degrade forecast quality. Now, some real world issues in operationalizing, as John pointed out, you need to solve the end user's problem. And sometimes that's not what the researcher has planned to solve. You have to do that listening up front. The coding has to be robust. We, have, we tend to bring in software engineers, trained software engineers, to make that code robust, assure data are QC'd, and it's very different than working um, with training data that is historical and you've had time to deal with. We also leave time for iterative refinement, where the first version of the system may be run for a while. At the same time, we're looking at developing the next versions. We assess those current ones that allow us to bug fix and make a version 1.1. But we then were able to do assessment on the original version, find out what works well, what doesn't, and do this iteratively so that by the time you deliver code, you have refined a very robust code. What happens if the data don't arrive on time? And that was one of the last questions in the last session. You have to plan for de graceful degradation. If the data from the, the, the site doesn't get there, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to assume persistence? Are you going to do some sort of, um, you know, of filling in the gap? In the case of solar data, we know the solar angle change. So we certainly want to consider that. And the users then must trust the machine learning model. And as we know, this is a workshop on trustworthy AI. It has to be trustworthy if you want the end user to use it. And the display has to be easy for the end user to read, again, talking to them. It may not be the same as what the researcher thinks is needed. Now, we, we've done um, various systems since then. Uh, most recently, we're working with the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research to produce a forecasting system for both wind and solar for them. And like that original system, we bring in both the physical models, those that are outlined in dark blue here, as well as a variety of AI models to make this work. And in summary, these sorts of tech transfer can work. Machine learning is needed to advance these applications, both in weather, climate, S to S scales, everything. And it's become a necessary component of modern weather forecasting systems. We're finding that this explainable AI is important for trust and for use by the end users and is becoming a necessary component for this operationalization. So thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, and uh, Jeb, uh, take it away for the last presentation, and then we'll go on with our fireside chat. Great. So hopefully everybody can see my slide. Yes, we see so, you. Hi. I am Jeb Stewart. I'm with the Global Systems Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, <clears throat> and our laboratory is also on the research side of NOAA. And so I'm here to give you kind of a perspective about how we think about research ourselves and transitions. I'll get into a little more specifics about what R2O looks like within NOAA, and so as well as some of my thoughts for success, which are going to echo and sound a lot like our previous two speakers here. Uh, we have a lot of common, I think you'll see a common theme here towards the end. Hey, also, sorry, a warning there. Sorry, Jeb, we're not seeing your screen. No. Could you stop sharing and then reshare, please? Yep. Also, your webcam seems to be blacked. Blacked out. <laughs> All right. So we went through all this go. in the pre-show, but uh, we can see you now. We can. Okay. So let's try this again. So then... All right. How about now? You're good to go. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, keep going. All right. So just a quick warning. I have a lot of content on these slides. I'm not going to touch on everything in here, but I wanted it to be there for uh, context if you want to go back through it at a, a future time. 
Uh, so first, I want to give you kind of an internal perspective uh, within our laboratory about how we look at R&D transitions. Uh, we work on some very cool and impactful technology, uh, but like you've heard, we got to keep the end user in mind. If they're not ready for it or have no interest, transitions pretty much are not uh, worth it. So if you want to tra transition a technology or system, we need to keep that end user in mind. And this path can take many different forms or directions. We want to avoid those that we consider problematic. We can't force the technology to be used. If it takes too long, we can lose momentum, we can lose staff, or the technology become as a risk of becoming obsolete. So we want to try to remove these barriers as much as possible. Uh, when we consider where we want our technology to go, we often say R2X in our laboratory here, where this last letter can be a variety of different uh, destinations for technology. One of those is research to operations, the O, R2O, that we often hear about, we heard about earlier today. Operations to us is not specific to NOAA. It can be anyone's operations. This could be government agencies like FAA or Air Force. It could also be private companies. And it can be, and often is for some of our technology, international groups or entities outside the US. So the goal of these slides is to keep our minds open about where the technology developed could be a best fit. It may not be the path you first had in mind. Another area we talk about is commercialization of technology, in this case, R2C. So at NOAA, we have the ability to license our technology. Another option is the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or something called CRADA, where we can partner with a private company to jointly develop this technology. No money is exchanged, but it gives the company the right to use, develop, and potentially sell this technology. And NOAA can jointly develop and take advantage of these advances together. One of my favorites is an area we call other uses, R2U. In this case, we open source our projects or share our technology with communities. This is a transition from our perspective, even though it doesn't have the same uh, notation as like an operational center. We give others the opportunity to use and develop our technology based on our ideas, and we can continue to collaborate and jointly de develop this technology together. Last but not least is something to consider is when to per stop pursuing technology. This is an important part of the R&D process and is not a bad thing. It provides lessons learned. We always can get new ideas. And for us, it can happen for a variety of reasons, like no funding or it's not cost effective. Also, I would say that in our experience, there's a number of times where technology is way ahead of its time. And we might see that with some of these AI projects. It can be retired at some point, it'll come back. Uh, it'll become very impactful a couple of years later. So a couple of different options here to keep in mind. When developing technology, it's a good idea to think and reevaluate where you want to see this technology used in the future and there are many potential different paths to consider. Next, I was going to get into some specifics about the, uh, research, the NOAA's processes for transitions. Within NOAA, we have specific guidelines that measure how we move through the development process. Uh, we call these, these readiness levels of how we monitor and how we evaluate the maturity of technology. It provides us a way to measure the progress of transition as it moves through these different maturity stages. On this slide, we see the definitions for the various levels. Uh, we'll see these across NASA. We'll see these across other groups. Uh, these are the definitions specific to NOAA. Uh, from a, just an idea, from basic research, we go through to a kind of a proof of concept, evaluations, prototype, and eventually we get to a system that's close to operations. These help standardize our R&D process within NOAA, but at least it's a way to talk about technology developed in terms of its maturity. It gives us a good idea of where things are in our minds. So let's look at this in practice. If we take one example, we have used AI to improve an aspect of an atmospheric model. We've evaluated a proof of concept and we're ready to transition this technology to operations. First, we need to embed our AI in the latest code uh, that's considered the operational model and test it. This would be considered at the RL6 level. We wanna make sure it could be used in operations. Then we want to test in an environment that is similar to operations. We heard about this with John Williams earlier. We want to be as close to that operational environment as possible mimic it uh, if we can. When it's successful there, we have all our ducks in a row. This technology is now proven and tested and documented. It just basically will need to be turned on in the operational environment. This is what helps the transition and makes the transition easier. This is a very important aspect for our R2O process, and I'll come back to this point later. The key point to remember is that it needs to be tested in this operational environment. It needs to look, or at least an environment that mimics what operations looks like. This gets a lot of those uh, issues out of the way that you may encounter with data streams or missing libraries or operating system issues. We need to be as close as possible to the operation environment and work with similar restrictions. 
Uh, so where are these operational environments? We have a couple of different options within NOAA, and these often are these are called our test beds and proving grounds, and we have a, a variety of them across uh, the U.S. and associated with different parts of NOAA. This is an important aspect of our R2O process. Often, uh, the only way to operations within NOAA is through one of these test beds or proving grounds. There's a link on the slide that gives you more detail, but I'll give you a quick glance here in the following slides about a couple of the different ones. Depending on your technology you develop, a different test bed or proving ground might be the best location. For example, if you're working on aviation related technology, there's the aviation weather test bed at the top of the slide. If you're working on hurricane related technology, the joint hurricane test bed is probably your best bet. So you see the association with these various test beds and the ultimate destination for operations for that technology. And so these are some items to consider as we're looking through uh, what your technology might be de developed and where you might want that to end up and what test bed you might need to work through in order to get it there. Each are unique, each have some similarities and some overlap. There are several different options to evaluate to get this technology out there. So please consider this list when you're thinking about the operational aspects for NOAA. The next step is how. So throughout the year, we have a variety of calls of requests for proposals. These are important to watch for if you wish to transition technology. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms on this page. I, uh, some of these are internal to NOAA, some of them are external, some are annual, some are every three years, but we do have a variety of options out there. I'm most familiar with the top two, that we have this internal funding with an OER, that's where our laboratory sits, uh, through the Weather Program Office, the WPO often issues calls. Another big one that's open to outside groups is this Joint Technology Transfer Initiative, or JTTI, the second one here on the list. The good thing about these proposals is that it helps to find that transition entity, which could be one of those test beds or proving grounds I mentioned earlier, well, and it helps to find the actions needed to transition that technology, basically to move it through those readiness levels, they get it to that top level RL9 within operations, and the last part is it helps provide funding to make that happen. So it's a good way to get technology in NOAA. So R2O is interesting. Uh, we are always looking and trying to learn how to improve this process. John showed that perfect slide where we one in eight or even worse uh, technologies eventually make it. Uh, and some of you may have heard the term valley of death, which is that gap between research and operations. So this happens in government as well. And there are several papers that exist on this topic. So we're really looking to avoid this valley, uh, valley of death. A couple of things to consider with R2O to help it and uh, within NOAA, uh, and hopefully this will be some good fodder going into our discussion after these presentations. But the big aspect about transition is using the same tools, bringing R&D closer to operations. Operations does not want to see software that uses a new platform, requires special libraries or different operating systems. It's just too many moving parts. So ideally, we get our environments as close as possible here. Uh, being able to run in that same environment helps get a lot of those warts and wrinkles out before it is actually turned on operationally. And if we are able to work in those environments, it helps smooth and increases our transition time by a factor of five. So we've discussed a lot about R2O today, and there's this O2R. This is that concept where the operational environment is made available to the development side, providing an opportunity to run this technology for, uh, ready for transition in that environment that mimics operations. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the acronym O2R, to all, which is that back and forth and providing that. Uh, the one aspect here is this balanced agility. So we have the desire by our stakeholders, those operational stakeholders, those end users, they need the stability. They need that stability of this operational environment. We have the needs of our researchers who we want to continuously improve this technology to gain the benefits of our research. Those two need to coexist to improve our transitions and avoid that valley, valley of death. So working closely together is one way we can accomplish that. Outside of this, there are a couple of things we can do to leverage our NOAA relationships to help with transitions. One is by working closely with NOAA through other entities like the Cooperative Institutes or the Cooperative Science Centers uh, and those test beds and proving grounds I mentioned earlier. If you're able to work on jointly work on projects with those different groups, you can get much closer to those operational uh, entities and that can help those transitions as well. So we've, there we go, uh, we have a couple different ideas. I presented some of our ideas around what R2X, so the different entities we can discuss, the couple different pathways to consider for research transitions. We have about how NOAA tracks and monitors our transitions, as well as some information about our test beds and proving grounds you may not have been familiar with. And to wrap it up, we kind of talked about the, what is needed, and we heard this from all our different talk with speakers today about that, keeping that end user in mind and that end environment in mind. And that's an important perspective here, I think, going in to help speed up transitions. So thank you.
Thank you, Jeb. And thank you all three for putting your thoughts, for, for, for thinking carefully and sharing your thoughts on, uh, on our tool. I, th I think one of uh, the lessons first is that we need to listen and understand the user. And then uh, the easier we make it on the user, the better our chances uh, for, uh, for the R2O to, uh, to be successful. So we're going to transit now to uh, about 15 uh, minutes of, uh, of conversation between our three experts. We've got, um, I'll start with a, a, first, uh, a first question. Um, think, um, let's see. Let's see, I'll start. So compare the R2O process between the private sector, federal agency, national laboratory. What are the strengths and weaknesses uh, of of these different uh, of the, the different uh, entities. Go ahead. Uh, who wants to start? <laughs> I, I can start. Go ahead, John. Um, no, I think uh, one thing about industry is that we're fundamentally fundamentally motivated by you know profit versus cost, which can be really clarifying if you want to make the cost the the, the, the case for moving uh, on a project. Um, but some, though, though sometimes it can be difficult to get the, to the decision makers who have the authority to allocate the resources. So you still have that challenge. And, and that's particularly a challenge, I think, for new applications or new lines of business or, or some innovation. Um, when it does decide to move, industry can be very fast. I think, uh, you know, maybe uh, often faster than, than government and, and academia. On the other hand, industry is often focused on short-term results. Uh, and it's harder to gain support for a really a longer term research and development effort who may, that may not mature for many quarters or any years. So I think that's when act, where academia and, uh, and government collaborations can really come in and help because they often are able to do that. I, I know that NOAA in particular has some challenges uh, in the way that they do their annual budget. And of course, administration changes can, can have an impact. But I, I think there's a really great synergy between the, the time scales and the motivations of these three multi-sector groups. And I'll be glad to go next. Um, you know, John made some very good points there. And I think one thing that's a little different about the academic sector is our goal is really research and providing, um, you know, something solid that's publishable. Um, but we also you know, have a role of gathering multiple folks, you know, often the end user, um, you know, bring together with other researchers. Um, we do, however, usually need to have funding either from the end user or from uh, a government agency. Um, and we don't do the actual final operationalization. So therefore, there's always a process of technology transfer to that end user. Sometimes it may be NOAA, sometimes it might be a private company, somebody like IBM, um, but it's a little bit of a different role. We still have to run our systems quasi-operationally and ensure that they're robust, but then the research goes into something that somebody else uses in the long term. And Jeb? And no, I'll add in from the NOAA perspective here. So we are mainly concerned with stability uh, here. So we don't want to introduce changes that negatively impact uh, our operations. So as a government agency, there's a lot of people that depend on our data for life and safety, and that is part of our mission. And so we need to, there, that adds a uh, time into this process. And so we need to have trustworthy systems, a good point to this workshop here this week, uh, but the stability is a major concern. And so that will often play into our evaluation process to see, make sure technology is ready to transfer. And so we may not be as agile, but we're trying to be as agile as we can to introduce new technology, but we need the tools to evaluate uh, to make sure that we're not introducing something negative as part of that process. But I echo a lot of the comments here previously that it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's very, um, it doesn't mean that we can't bring in new technology. I think there's a lot of people we see in a lot of different services we have out there, but for some of our core products, that stability is uh, very important. All right, thank you. So we, we've got uh, speed versus sustainability, uh, different challenges. And so that leads to uh, a second question. 
are there things between, so rather than within industry, academia, and government, but between industry, uh, academia, and government that could help make the R2O process more efficient, taking advantage of the respective uh, strengths? And in, uh, we're thinking in terms of collaborative projects, open source code methods, open data, what, what can help between those entities? Yeah, I would say all of those things mentioned. Uh, and, and I think just talking to each other, I think the AI Institute has been you know, a great way to have some of this engagement and get to know each other and what we're working on and having some of these conversations about how can we combine efforts to meet the goals of multiple uh, uh, institutions? And you know, I think the National Science Foundation is is wants broader impacts for its work, and one way to do that is through research to operations. I think that the the, the cloud is potentially a game changer. I don't I don't know that I've necessarily necessarily seen that happen yet, but. Um, we have the ability to play in the same sandbox. You know, you don't have to come inside the IBM firewall necessarily for us to be able to develop something together. So I'm hoping as the Institute continues into its second through fifth years that, you know, we'll, we'll be seeing more opportunity to do that. And then, you know, of course, in the, the framework of open source, a containerization is, is a way to make our, our code bases play across multiple platforms. So they can be on-premise, they can be in Amazon, they can be in IBM Cloud or, or Azure or, or whatever, Google Cloud. So I, I think that there are a lot of techno technological innovations that are coming up that can really facilitate that collaboration as well. Yeah, super practical containerization, message received. <laughs> Too. And I very much agree with John that communication between the sectors really does help. You know, we understand what that end user needs. You know, we understand, um, you know, what NOAA needs to do, um, you know, to take some, to combine their forecasts with some of the other advances and what the private sector needs to do to meet their clients' needs, you know, such as in some of the examples that I showed. Um, John brought up con uh, cloud containerization. We are beginning to do that for some of our technology transfer initiatives. The other thing that the academic sector does that I think really does benefit the other sectors and R2O is publish the details of what we do. Now, of course, the private sector can't do that because of the profit motive, but the academic sector does. And that makes it easy for the private sector and some of the public sector to see what the latest research is, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and we disclose that and hopefully that enables the R to O process to go more efficiently and they don't have to reinvent the wheel and try some of the methods that really didn't work as well. Jeff, do you want to comment also? I do. I'm going to sound like a broken record here, though. But I'm going to bring to mention the communication. It's 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 great to be having all these groups together in the same room talking about this. NOAA is a large organization, and just knowing the right contacts within NOAA in order to see these technologies, you know, help accelerate them through one of these test beds or proving grounds, and making those connections to the right people is part of that communication. And so that that goes a long way to helping these technologies get into NOAA and eventually to an operational state. So. Communication through this uh, institute like AI2ES has been great uh, for that aspect. Great, and yeah, we we love we love this aspect of communication. And I'll, I'll comment also that the new AI Institute, NSF AI Institutes, are out, and there is a considerable private sector part participation and funding. And so I think it's uh, it's both wells to to have uh, those, to have those collaborations just broaden more like AI2ES. I'm going to go to the question list here, and the next one I have. From Jorge, uh, what would be a priority, more data scientists or more technology? When uh, and referring that when that time is up for changes in our ecosystems and planet, so data scientists or technology, what's more needed to make yeah. things work? I would say, just from my perspective, uh, we, we need more data scientists. Um, okay. That, you know, but and and particularly a certain breed of data scientist who is also familiar with you know, the physics, the, you know, the understands weather, you know, has that, that blending of the domain expertise 
uh, and the, the data science and the coding uh, techniques. I think it's, it's that combination that really allows you to apply these, these method, methods uh, thoughtfully and, and productively. Yeah, I very much agree with John that having people who can do both the physics of the problem as well as the data science is critically important. Um, often, as we've heard all this week, is bringing in aspects of the physics helps make the, the machine learning more trustworthy to begin with. Um, so that then it's more likely to get used in operations if the end user can trust it because there is a tie to that physics built in. Yeah, I'm going to differ a little bit here, but I'm going to go for both. And I know that's not a fair <laughs> answer. <laughs> you don't bring opinions. This is why the fire starts. Yes. <laughs> so we... we... <laughs> Yeah, from, a, from an operational perspective, there's concerns about performance, there's concerns about the, the system underneath. And so there needs to be at least some involvement of somebody familiar with computer or the, the, the operations and computer aspects and the programming aspects to make it performant. Uh, you know, for us in our world, if it, our data is late, it has less value to particular users uh, for some of our cases. And so in, a, in my ideal world, we have more data scientists and more on the computer science aspects working together on this so that we can get those great algorithms that the, the data scientists develop and the trustworthy science out there, but at a performance level that is needed for our operational side. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly don't disagree with that. And if I can amend my answer, I want to add also social scientists, because I think it's social scientists That's that right. help us make sure that what we're doing really is going to be useful and have benefit at the end of the day. I completely agree. We need to make it interpretable and understandable by the people as well. So the, 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 that, the, that helps a lot. And I think uh, day three of, of the short course really showed us the, the pitfalls and, and the potential problems that we have in front of us. So having data scientists who are broadly trained uh, will, uh, will, really, will really help us navigate this, this likely boom of applications of AI. The, the next question I'm, I have, um, this, is, this is from Amy. If you could change, create one thing to make the R2O process more efficient, what would that be? Well, I'll jump in and say, first of all, make sure you're solving a real user problem. I think that's absolutely number one. Um, I, and maybe if I could just add a couple, I think you know, it, in, in government, uh, sustained funding and consistent leadership is, is really important. Uh, you know, I think that's changing administrations and even within NOAA, some of the ways the funding works, you know, year to year budgeting can make it really hard to sustain some of these, uh, these projects over time. And in academia, I'll, I'll say maybe what we need is a, a culture change a little bit to reward research to operations as a fundamental academic metric. Not just publication. Mm -hmm. Sue, Jeb, the one, um, a booster <laughs> suggestion. Well, I'm glad I'm glad John mentioned that because I'm not sure I can <laughs> about okay. funding cycles within NOAA. Uh, but the, from my perspective, it's uh, a lot of the same tools. So it requires kind of training on both sides to get our operational guy, uh, teams more familiar with uh, machine learning and how to what the trustworthy is. And so maybe that's more of that social science perspective about what this is and what it means and how it works. But I think there's also a perspective of our data scientists being more familiar with what the operational environment looks like, uh, because there's a lot of restrictions that are there. And so for us, you know, the, when I mentioned in my slides here, br bringing together closer to R and D to operations, so, so I'm going both ways. That O to R, R to O process goes a long way to helping increase the speed at which we can do transitions and a more the likelihood that a transition succeeds. Mm -hmm. And those are excellent points that uh, both John and Jeb brought up. Um, I guess I would add that, you know, thinking about robustness of your code, how it's going to be, um, you know, transferred later, you know, really starting with that end in mind as you begin a project. So knowing that you're going to operationalize, knowing that you're going to, be providing something for the end user and really planning that 
from the initial steps. So you don't have to redo everything after the research version of it, um, you know, and just make it robust from the very beginning. Right, and uh, we have time for one question. We have a couple more minutes, so you're gonna have to answer relatively uh, briefly. It's a question regarding graduate students. And by the way, we need you. You heard we need a lot of data scientists. So if you're a graduate student listening to us, you are in the right field. And so the question is from Alka. And as she says uh, here, she's uh, physics-based AI are becoming now um, and not novel anymore. I think it's still novel, but looking three years into the future, what is the next big thing that a graduate student in environmental science, hydrology, uh, and I assume AI should focus on? I think um, it really is understanding this whole process. Um, you know, bringing in some of the aspects that haven't been traditionally brought in, like understanding those end user needs, working with social scientists to kind of get that process of translating your work to something that's usable, to trying to think in terms of value chain rather than just the, the physics and getting a paper out. Um, I think that could be a game changer uh, if we get students who really understand these issues coming into our organizations, um, a lot less effort to come up on what it needs, what needs to happen to do this R to O process. And a very quick word from John or Jeff, because we're out of time there. <laughs> well, fundamentally, I think that where the rubber meets the road is then helping to use the data that we have to make better decisions. And I've argued that one way to do that is to increasingly create a series of scenarios that people can do cost loss um, reasoning from. So I, I think a lot more needs to be done to actually connect the great weather data that we have to how do we really optimize our decisions. And Jeb, a final word before we leave it to Amy. <laughs> I was just going to say more in the explainable AI. We're always looking for the whole point of this conference is the trustworthiness of our data and our science behind it. And so, I mean, even in three years, I still think that's going to be an issue in our three to five years. And so continuing down that road to improve how we understand what's going on within these models and understand the data it's producing. And Amy, take, take us home. <laughs> hey. Okay, I just have one slide of wrap up. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who has been involved in this, uh, especially NCAR slash UCAR, because they helped run all of the multimedia behind in the background, all of our speakers, um, everybody who helped organize. It was amazing. I thank all of you for coming and participating. I want to make a couple of quick announcements. We announced um, this yesterday, but I don't know if everybody heard us. There is a new AMS journal that's coming out that's going to be focused on AI for the environmental sciences, broadly as the AMS sciences. It will be announced formally by AMS next week in the AMS soundings, but I'm letting you know about it. Um, I have my standard acknowledgments. I wanted to say um, one quick other thing. There will be a follow-up survey because this is largely funded. This is funded by NSF through our institute. There's going to be a follow-up survey. Um, it will should be coming from Tasia. Um, or it may say Horizon Research. I'm not sure which, what the mail system is gonna say, but please fill out that survey because we would really welcome your feedback. We use that to make things better because we will hold more summer schools. I don't know what our plans are for next summer yet. We will announce them. Follow us on Twitter um, and you'll hear more from us. And I think that's it. Thank you very much to everybody. <laughs>